Welcome back, everyone. It's wonderful to have you back. Hope you had an excellent lunch and some time to spend time together uh, discussing some of the amazing debates that have already started today. Uh, thank you very much for, for returning now to get started. Uh, now we will be working on the youth issues together. Uh, investir dans la jeunesse rurale, quelle priorité? Investing in the youth in rural areas, what are our priorities going to be? Let me just remind you for a couple, just a couple of things. We'd like to be sure that you realize that you can use Twitter, please, and Slido. If you look in the back of your program at the very last page, there are instructions for doing this so that we can get you very heavily engaged in the discussion. So all of that is on the last page of your program. And now, uh, if we're ready, shall we begin the session? Um, I'd like to invite uh, Mario Pessini, the director of the Development Center, to come forward now and invite the panelists to join him as well. Thank you. Mario, over to you. Thank you. So. Good afternoon. Uh, let me invite the important panelists that are with us in this uh, crucial session. And in this respect, I would like to invite Victoire Tomega Dogbe, uh, which is the Minister of Grassroots Development, Craft, Youth, and Youth Employment of Togo. <laughs> and you will discover in a second that she does many other things as well. And then Awa Kava, which is co founder of the and chief executive officers of Sore Tool from Dakar, Senegal. Thank you. Please get close. Then we will have uh, uh, by uh, connection, uh, by air, therefore, Hans Yor, which is Corporate Head of Agriculture for Nestlé. And last but not least, let me invite Ibrahima Kuribali, which is President of the National Coordination of Peasant Organization of Mali. <laughs> Please, let's sit. And now, just before we start uh, this important discussion, let me also tell you that as we are discussing of women and youth, we have asked a series of uh, everybody who wanted to participate to present their view of the future, uh, but in form of photo. And we therefore receive many contribution to this uh, exercise. And this many contribution of this exercise uh, uh, produce a selection. And uh, whilst uh, we are now uh, reached also by David Asiama, which is founder of the Chief Executive Officers of Agro Mindset from Ghana, which is with us, I would like to invite the two winners of this uh, uh, photo uh, contribution, let's say, that we have had. Please, the two winners can come on the podium, please, come on. <laughs> I have to confess to you that I am a photographer as well, so I'm very happy to be with my colleagues. Economist for me is a secondary activity. <laughs> and, uh, and let me also give you the prize then. Here we have the first prize, let's go to Ismail Polarani, Odetola, is you? Yes, sir. Okay, this is uh, the <laughs> witnessing of your contribution. Thank you very much. You can see the photo at the entrance of the building. If you have not already seen them, go quickly, but after the session. And here we have the second certificate for Bala Kane. Thank you very much. <laughs> Merci beaucoup. And for votre participation, et vous, vous êtes arrivé. Je vous laisse uh, le microphone si vous voulez dire deux mots. Euh, bonjour à tout le monde, ou bien bonsoir. Euh, moi, je suis là dans la conférence depuis hier. Et on parle de développement, on parle de jeunesse. Mais moi, particulièrement, je me sens étranger parce que, en fait, moi, je suis dans le domaine culturel. Je voulais juste poser une question. C'est quelle place ça occupe, en fait, dans le débat sur le développement Parce que quand on voit les États-Unis, on voit le Japon, on voit la Chine, ils se sont développés grâce à la culture. Et donc, j'aimerais demander quelle place ça occupe 
vraiment dans le développement pour vous. Parce que la culture est au début et à la fin de tout développement. Parfait. En tant que photographe, je me sens prêt de cette question. Moi aussi. Yeah, for me, I, I see the future of work. Uh, the, uh, the, the photographer was actually inspired by my background, actually where I grew up and my experience in life. So City in the Village was actually the title of my photos. And it was because I grew up in a place where almost nothing works. And because in the world, we, in especially in Africa and in some part of Asia, we have so many rural places and we have just few urban areas. And most people in all these places, they don't really have anything to do the idol and all that. So I believe the future of work is for us to pull all these young people out of the rural places, out, out of the rural areas where they are and give them the right education. Not that there are no schools there, there are schools there, but what are they teaching them? The quality of education they have and they get in those schools. So all of those things and the right to technology, not just to go to school, but to get the education that can help you become someone and to be exposed. So thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank you for your contribution first and secondly for your question and, uh, and uh, 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 words. I will use this both with your permission to address also the question that we'll address at the panel because both you are raising crucial issues. Should young people leave the rural areas and by means of education find alternatives to their present condition that is not sustainable? Et de l'autre côté, dans quelle mesure, dans les stratégies de développement, la culture, c'est un asset, c'est un levier pour le développement et pas simplement un uh, amusement qui vient après des choses sérieuses. Merci beaucoup aux deux. Thank you very much. Let's go. So with that, we enter in the, we have already entered in the field of discussion. And let me summarize why we decided to concentrate on these issues. And then I will start giving the floor to the important panelists that are here with us. Uh, f some years ago, I, if I am not uh, wrong, Henri uh, Bernard, it, it must be uh, five years ago, we destinated the African Economic Outlook to the issue of demography in Africa. It's a report that we have been doing for 17 years. And uh, that year, it was on youth, or was on demography. And demography brought to our eyes that the development of population in Africa didn't have historical precedent, both in terms of volume and in terms of speed. Therefore, the question was, this is great news, because at present in Africa, there is one young people for one old people. And therefore, the old is heavy, sometimes if it has also my side, is, is heavy on the shoulder of the young people. So if we will have more young for each old person, things will be better. Yeah, but on the other hand, the young people need to have a place in society, to be included in society. If we don't, then the risk can be many, and maybe I will ask around the table also what do they see as opportunity, but also as risk. Obviously, we had in mind what happened in, in Tunisia some years ago, a country that for 10 years had 5% of growth every year, very good enrollment in primary school, 100% actually, very good enrollment in secondary school, very good management of public finance, minus three deficit, ordinary deficit, whilst all the northern countries did much worse, including Germany and other uh, renewed example. So in that case, growth, economy, didn't growth jobs. Because despite better school, people go to school, family invest on them, they end the school and they have a job in the formal economy. And it exploded. So the question was, can we identify passport for young people to enter in society? And in reality, we start by saying, well, in Africa, you know, there are natural resources, it's great, uh, it's a, a vehicle for development. Asia use uh, low uh, wage uh, labor to develop. 
maybe here it could be natural resources. And obviously we observed that in Australia, uh, you, when you uh, do an economic activity, you invest uh, $60 per square kilometer in exploration to find mining. In Africa, only $5. So we said, oh, there is much more space for further uh, exploration, and so maybe even further mining. That's true, and it can create jobs. But let's remember that we are talking of a sector that employ very low skills, engineers come from other parts of the world, and moreover, and is known for having declining productivity. So the creation of job will last for little time. Therefore, also thanks to a work that we have done and was introduced this morning with the European Commission on Youth, we said, ah, maybe we could exploit global value chain. With global value chain, when you start a job, you don't need like Mr. Ford to build a big roof to uh, have under the roof all the machine to produce a car from the beginning to the end. You can start with a little roof or even a garage specialized in a part of the process of production and then be connected with the global value chain. Therefore, there are more opportunities to enter in jobs. But then we went to look at how many intermediary goods were produced in Africa. And uh, in 93, only 1.4% of the global production of intermediary goods was done in Africa. So we said, okay, but now it's different. Time has passed. At that time, we didn't use the word global value chain. What's today? It's not 1.4%, it's 2.2. So you can understand that many years has passed, have passed, but the rhythm for getting connected with the global value chain is slow. We can hope it will increase. Uh, there are interesting experience of free zones, Ethiopia is very often quoted, and other can be created. If particularly you choose the right sector, not as we did in Italy, we create uh, a free zones uh, in the industry that then produce what we call cathedral in a desert because nothing happened around. Uh, but if you choose mechanic or other sector, this can help. But still, it's not the answer. It's part of the answer. So we said, okay, Keynesian measure. And the people say, ah, oh, but the OECD, Keynesian is not. No, 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 we can discuss Keynesian measure. Why not? The problem is that the fiscal resources of many African countries, not all, because it's a story. Uh, it's not a reality, it's a prejudice. In reality, uh, South Africa has 29% of taxes out of GDP, Tunisia 31%, Morocco 26 Just to give you an idea, Chile is 24 Mexico is 16 So despite that our African countries do effort, in many others, the fiscal resources are limited. You cannot create public jobs. And how many? In Egypt, to keep the same percentage of public employees of today, the country should create every year 80, uh, 180,000 public jobs. Nobody can do it. Therefore, we said, what can we do at the end? Obviously, a little bit of everything, a little bit of mining, a little bit of global value chain, a little bit of public employment when possible and so on. But there is no alternative solution. We need to address the existing economy of Africa with the small firms, with the entrepreneurs, with the endogenous resources, and where? Here come a crucial point. Everybody taken by a fashion effect is speaking about urbanization, cities. The economists like it very much because they say, you know, cities are more productive. And then you ask them why? Because they have economy of agglomeration. There is a little bit I have to say, fire is burning, why? because it has a burning strand. It doesn't explain anything. In reality, economy of agglomeration are an ex post observation. And city work, when you have public goods, if you don't, you risk to create enormous congestion of people that take three hours to go to work, three hours to come back from work, and they are not more productive. They are less productive because there are external neg negative externalities. And moreover, Many of the young people that will appear in the year to come live in rural areas. So we cannot consider only the urban areas. Obviously, the two are related. 
because uh, when you live in rural areas, then you need a city where you go and you buy stuff and you go to the discotheque and then you go to the store and so on. But they will be in rural areas. Let's concentrate continuously on urban and then we will have, have this monstrous agglomeration with enormous externalities that will make things dif difficult, more difficult than today. But what to do in rural areas and how to guarantee entrepreneurship and strengthening the existing small firms there. This was the reason why we said, let's have this session on this matter. And to start the discussion and stopping an Italian to speak, which is always difficult, um, uh, let me uh, start by giving the floor to the person which is close to me. Because this person, as I said, is the Minister of Youth and so on, uh, but to tell you the story, she's also in charge from the President to coordinate the preparation of the plan of Togo. And therefore, the question to her is, yeah, but Togo, how is doing it? Uh, is it concentrating on activity in rural areas? Is it thinking to this uh, uh, local value chain that IFAD this morning indicated strongly as being an important passport for development? How do you see the things? Please. Merci beaucoup. Merci pour cette uh, opportunité que vous nous donnez de contribuer au débat sur l'inclusion des femmes et des jeunes. En fait, je pense que ce qu'il nous faut, c'est un changement de paradigme, un changement dans l'approche, dans la manière dont nous concevons nos politiques de développement. Et aujourd'hui, euh, ce que nous constatons dans la plupart des cas, c'est que on fait des politiques sectorielles, et on fait une addition de ces politiques, et c'est ça la, la politique nationale de développement. Nous, au Togo, nous avons voulu changer d'approche pour nous poser les vraies questions. Quels sont les atouts de développement de notre pays Et quels sont les secteurs porteurs de croissance sur lesquels on agit pour créer la croissance, pour induire la croissance, pour créer le maximum d'emplois pour les jeunes Le cas du Togo, le, on est connu comme, pour euh, avoir euh, un port euh, en eau profonde de la sous-région et puis nous avons l'agriculture et nous avons identifié ces deux secteurs comme étant des secteurs en y investissant énormément on peut créer, on peut induire la croissance créer la, les, les, les emplois pour les jeunes et cela induit une transformation totale de l'économie de notre pays alors la, la, la question quand on, euh, on a commencé le processus on s'est rendu compte qu'on n'était même pas capable de quantifier les emplois à créer. Ça veut dire que ça pose un réel problème de système d'information, de système de collecte d'information. Et la question que nous nous posons, et elle est la, la vraie, c'est comment investir donc dans ces secteurs-là pour pouvoir rassurer les jeunes, créer la confiance, le capital confiance fixer les jeunes ruraux dans leur milieu rural parce qu'ils ne doivent pas se sentir différents des jeunes urbains qui sont mieux nantis. Comment réduire la marginalisation et éviter le risque de radicalisation de ces jeunes qui perdent l'espoir et qui et se retrouvent euh, enrôlés dans des aventures assez hasardeuses. Et cela nous a posé également deux, deux défis majeurs. Le premier défi, c'est l'amélioration du cadre et des conditions de vie des populations dans le monde rural, en milieu rural. Également, le défi de la création de richesses sur la base des potentialités de chaque région, parce que chaque région de notre pays a des potentialités. Donc, comment créer des richesses à partir de ces potentialités et multiplier les opportunités d'emploi pour les jeunes dans ces milieux Alors, ça a amené, dans le cadre de, donc, de ce processus de mise en place de, ce, de ce, ce, cette politique nationale, ça nous a amené à, à penser à certaines mesures fortes. La première mesure, c'est développer et moderniser l'économie rurale. Je ne parle pas de l'agriculture. Développer et moderniser l'économie rurale. La deuxième chose, c'est d'accompagner les jeunes à saisir ces opportunités-là. Donc, l'entrepreneuriat rural de ces jeunes à travers le développement des chaînes de valeur. Parce que pour nous, il, dans, il faut cette approche dans tous les secteurs, que ce soit l'artisanat, le tourisme, l'agriculture, etc. Et comment assurer que les jeunes sont bien formés pour être adaptés à la demande et à leur employabilité. Alors, pour ce, le premier point, ce qui a été important, et nous avons euh, constaté, c'est qu'il faut 
intensifier l'investissement dans le domaine de l'agro-business, dans le trans la transformation agroalimentaire, créer des clusters agro-industriels dans cette approche de, de chaîne de valeur. Et cela met en, en, en jeu le secteur public et le secteur privé. Le secteur public, c'est-à-dire que nous devons, par exemple, créer un cadre attractif pour intéresser les investisseurs nationaux comme internationaux. Nous devons identifier à l'avance des zones qu'il faut aménager, des zones agricoles qu'il faut aménager. Nous devons faire en sorte que, euh, par exemple, quand un investisseur arrive, qu'il n'ait pas de problème de foncier, qu'il soit rassuré sur la transparence, etc. Et nous avons également, euh, dans l'approche, essayé de créer des infrastructures. Il faut l'eau, il, il faut maîtriser l'eau, il faut, euh, faut l'énergie, il faut des pistes rurales pour les enclaver, etc., etc. Et l'objectif pour nous, c'est d'arriver à moderniser dans son ensemble l'agriculture et attirer les jeunes, parce qu'aucun jeune n'a envie d'aller vers l'agriculture avec les roues des d'abat, mais plutôt un, une agriculture qui est totalement mécanisée. La deuxième chose, c'est aussi d'amener les jeunes à voir l'agriculture comme un business. Je veux, je veux gagner de l'argent avec l'agriculture. Et là, nous avons euh, mis en place un programme qui est dédié au, au développement des chaînes de valeur agricole. Donc, vous prenez par exemple le manioc, c'est de la production à la collecte, en passant par euh, le stockage, la transformation et la mise sur marché. Et c'est un projet qui met en relation les structures privées, la banque et les jeunes. Nous avons également pensé à la professionnalisation de ces jeunes-là en mettant en place des institutions, des instituts de formation pour le développement, par exemple l'agriculture, la pisciculture, l'élevage, etc. Donc c'est tout un plan qui accompagne le développement du, du monde rural. Mais un des problèmes essentiels, c'est l'accès au financement. Parce que si on n'a pas des financements qui sont adaptés sur toute la chaîne de valeur, c'est un échec. Donc aujourd'hui, la réflexion dans notre pays, c'est de mettre en place un fonds intégré qui rassure et les banques, qui rassure et les entrepreneurs et qui fait en sorte que tous ceux qui sont intéressés par la chaîne de valeur puissent être euh, financés et que les, les risques soient mitigés. Et pour euh, finir, je pense qu'il y a un, un point essentiel, c'est d'avoir en tête qu'il faut toujours réduire les inégalités entre le monde rural et le monde urbain. Quand les, il, y a, il y a le minimum d'infrastructures, de santé, d'éducation, etc., je vous assure, le jeune va accepter de travailler dans son milieu, de créer la richesse dans son milieu, de vivre décemment, décemment dans son milieu. Et nous avons aussi dans notre pays un programme d'urgence de développement communautaire qui nous permet d'accélérer et d'intensifier les réponses à ce genre de besoins d'infrastructures. Merci beaucoup, Madame la Ministre, parce que euh, vous mettez à feu plusieurs aspects, mais moi je voudrais souligner surtout euh, une série. La première, la première euh, il ne faut pas partir d'une programmation sectorielle d'allocation des ressources publiques aux différents secteurs oui. business as usual, en pensant qu'en faisant ce qu'on a toujours fait et les bureaucraties, ils aiment tellement, on arrivera à la solution des problèmes. Il faut faire l'enfer. Il faut partir de l'identification des problèmes et des opportunités. Et là, Deuxième point, vous avez identifié comme un des opportunités portantes euh, un différent type de développement rural. Troisième, vous nous dites, mais le développement rural, pour être fait, il ne peut pas être sectoriel non plus. Bien sûr, il faut utiliser l'agriculture, mais il y a beaucoup de non-farm jobs qui sont aux alentours et il faut donc avoir des projets intégrés de développement rural. Un point qui, d'un côté, répond à une question de nos photographes, de où est-ce qu'on met la culture. Ben, en vérité, on veut développer des communautés rurales et pas des secteurs agricoles. Et donc là-dedans, il y a différentes activités. Il y a autant l'enseignement scolaire, comme les, les coiffeurs, comme les agriculteurs. Donc la logique est un développement communautaire en bas au nom. Mais disons-le clairement, ici, il y a une forte responsabilité des organismes internationaux que dans les années 70, ils ont détruit les programmes intégrés de développement rural, en pensant qu'il fallait aller plus directement sur des mesures efficaces, et si l'efficacité n'était pas démontrée, il fallait l'abandonner. Et donc, on a démontré les projets intégrés de développement rural. Malheureusement, parce qu'aujourd'hui, on se retrouve à devoir réinventer la Lune et recréer une approche qui avait été expérimentée et qui, compte tenu du temps, n'a pas laissé beaucoup de signes dans le territoire. Il existe bien évidemment encore des corridors, il existe des zones libres, il existe des nouvelles villes, mais sont sporadiques. Et l'ensemble de ces tâches de léopard ne constituent en, en, en eux seuls 
une stratégie. Mais alors, ça, c'était le cas du Togo et on apprend beaucoup. Permettez-moi de demander maintenant à Ibrahim Koulibaly. Voilà, le Mali, il est dans une situation avec des défis particuliers. Le défi, entre autres, on le sait, quatre fois le territoire de la France et moins qu'un dixième des forces de sécurité qu'il y a à la France. Donc, euh, extrêmement difficile la situation. Mais est-ce qu'une hypothèse comme celle que nous euh, présente le Togo, c'est-à-dire une hypothèse de construction d'une stratégie de développement du pays, euh, peut faire face aux problèmes que le pays y vit aujourd'hui Et si oui, comment la faire Merci, merci beaucoup. Euh, merci à ceux qui ont eu euh, l'idée d'organiser cette euh, conférence et, afin qu'on puisse amener nos idées dans cette discussion. Euh, depuis trois ans, deux, trois ans, je pense qu'on n'a jamais autant parlé des jeunes en Afrique. Euh, si on en parle aujourd'hui autant, c'est parce qu'on se rend compte qu'effectivement, ce qui devait être fait certainement n'a pas été fait. La population a beaucoup augmenté. Si vous, je prends l'exemple d'un pays comme le Mali, ça faisait 4 millions d'habitants en 1960 à l'indépendance. Aujourd'hui, on est 17 millions. Et c'est avec les mêmes instruments qu'on a gérés depuis ces 60 ans. Et donc, forcément, on se retrouve avec des situations qui deviennent compliquées. Et est-ce qu'il est encore temps Je pense que c'est ça même la question. Est-ce qu'on peut encore indiquer le problème Parce que les menaces deviennent de plus en plus importantes. Et, et quand on parle des jeunes en milieu urbain, c'est vrai qu'il y a des problèmes en milieu urbain. Mais en milieu rural, les jeunes sont encore beaucoup, beaucoup plus mal lotis. Parce qu'ils n'ont pas accès à une éducation de base, de qualité. Ce sont les, 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 les enseignants les, de, de très mauvaise qualité qui vont dans les campagnes. Les autres vont dans le privé, dans les villes. Donc, les, les, les jeunes, ils, ils sortent de l'école, six ans après, dix ans, ils les traitent pratiquement, ils ne parlent même pas euh, le français. Et donc, oh, et ils n'arrivent pas à, à bien s'inscrire dans leur famille paysanne pour pratiquer l'agriculture comme il faudrait. Et ils voient les lumières du monde. Ils voudraient vivre comme tout, tous les jeunes du monde, c'est-à-dire avec euh, les mêmes envies. Et, et donc, ils, 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 ils soient... Et là, je pense qu'il y a trois options seulement qui s'offrent à ces jeunes-là. C'est-à-dire... Soit ils arrivent à émigrer, si la famille les aide à, à émigrer, ils partent en Europe, euh, essaient de venir en Espagne, euh, s'ils arrivent, et donc c'est la question si c'est noient pas, et ensuite euh, ils finissent dans les camps de concentration. Et ensuite, euh, c'est l'orpaillage aujourd'hui qui est la seule activité en dehors de l'agriculture qui arrive à donner un revenu si les jeunes ont la chance. Donc aujourd'hui, pour dire dans le cas du Mali, dans certains villages, s'il y a un décès, on ne trouve pas quelqu'un pour entrer. Parce que les jeunes sont partis, tous partis chercher de l'or. Donc, ça veut dire que les jeunes, ils ne croient plus en rien. Et ils veulent gagner de l'argent par tous les moyens. Et aujourd'hui, ils rejoignent les groupes armés. Ce n'est pas le cas du Mali seulement, c'est toute la région. Il n'y a pas un pays en Afrique de l'Ouest qui n'est pas en guerre. D'une façon ou d'une autre, ou qui n'a pas été en guerre. Donc, qu'est-ce qui se passe Pourquoi est-ce qu'on fait, on fait comme si ça va Et on, a, on veut continuer à utiliser les mêmes instruments de politique et croire qu'on va indiquer ces problèmes-là. Ce n'est pas possible. Pour la simple raison que et le vrai problème de tout ça, ce n'est pas parce qu'on n'a pas les politiques. Je pense que l'Afrique est le pays où on fait le plus de séminaires dans le monde. On a tout, on a fait des séminaires sur tout. On a les, les rapports, on a les stratégies, on a les politiques souvent même qui sont votées par les parlements, qui sont dans les tiroirs. Personne ne les utilise. Et on vient chaque jour avec la Banque mondiale a dit ça, il faut faire comme ça. Le FMI a dit ça. Et donc, on ne s'en sortira jamais comme cela. Donc, la solution, c'est qu'il faut relocaliser la question du développement, partir des vrais besoins des communautés et redescendre à la base. Et aussi, il ne s'agit pas de dire on a fait la décentralisation. Tous les pays africains ont fait la décentralisation, mais personne, aucun pays n'envoie l'argent dans les villages, dans les communes rurales. L'argent est dans la capitale. Donc, comment voulez-vous que les jeunes restent dans le village puisqu'il n'y a pas d'investissement Il n'y a, a rien qui s'est fait, en vérité. Puisque l'argent ne descend pas au niveau local. Même quand on fait un projet, tous les jours, on a des projets, banque mondiale, machin, tout ça bilatéral, multilatéral, l'aide publique et comment on appelle, l'aide budgétaire. Il y a plein d'argent. On dit toujours qu'il n'y a pas l'argent. Mais c'est quelques personnes qui accaparent l'argent, qui prennent toutes les ressources et qui sont là, qui sont assis, qui ne veulent pas que les choses changent et qui viennent dire que oui, ça va changer. Moi, je pense qu'on est en train de se leurrer, mais aujourd'hui, les jeunes ont pris les armes. Faisons très attention. Merci. Merci Merci beaucoup. Merci beaucoup aussi d'adresser les problèmes directement. Et c'est ce qu'on demande. Et aussi pour mettre en exercice toute une série de choses. 
il faut affronter les thèmes de sécurité, mais si on n'a pas aussi un plan à moyen et long terme, difficile de donner des véritables réponses. Mais si le plan, on le fait comme on a toujours implémenté les choses dans le passé, aux mises en œuvre, ça ne mènera pas loin, ça reproduira ce qui a toujours été le cas. Mais cela, ça ne concerne pas seulement que les autorités nationales, ça concerne aussi les pourvoyeurs de fonds, qui opèrent exactement de la même façon. Donc voilà un appel à dire, il faut euh, revenir en ayant une communauté d'intervention, la communauté, et écouter ce que dans la communauté est fait. Alors là, maintenant, on a David. That David can contribute exactly in this moment of the discussion because David operate at the level of uh, uh, the bottom, the, the, the ground, operate with entrepreneurs and operate to animate and to give voice exactly to the actor on the ground and not just the public policies. So what is your experience? Is it feasible? Are there energies? Are actors on the ground? And if so, how to help them? Right. Thank you. Thank you for this opportunity. I'm David, and um, that was a very good question because over the years, the approaches have been top down. Um, people sit in Berlin, they sit in London, they sit in big headquarters and decide what has to be done on the grassroots. But today, there are lots of startups, there are lots of people pursuing social entrepreneurship. I started Agro Mindset of, as a social entrepreneurship company which we had a mandate to educate young people on the prospects of agriculture, its self-employment role and role creation. We realized that there were lots of young people that didn't know much about the p opportunities that existed in the agriculture do domain. So we set off to educate young people and gain understanding in the area. I remember back in the day I had to do my master's um, project work or dissertation on the trends and constraint of the Ghanaian youth engagement in agriculture. And I chose Kumasi because that's where I live, so I could have understanding to the issue. Today, there are lots of startups that are pursuing social entrepreneurship, and they are doing it with passion and empathy. They go down to the rural areas to understand what has to be done. And they are the ones who are reorienting the ordinary person, and I think they need support. I talk about orientation because, I mean, we can sit here and talk about taking our girl child to school, providing good education. There are schools around these areas, but then would people go there? That is another question. If a young person sees that it's a waste of time to spend the next 10 years in school while he could make some money, we make nonsense of education then. I have a situation where a young lady told me all her friends had given birth at the age of 18, and she, fe she felt left out when she moved with them because they all had kids so she also wanted to get pregnant. So if you think you're providing education for them, to that person, it won't work. I've had a situation where a worker wouldn't show up, wouldn't show up, um, show up at work because his friends at home were cooking rice. And if he came to work, he wouldn't get some of the rice. I mean, it doesn't make sense to you, but to the person, <laughs> he wants to be part of that uh, meal. So as um, we keep debating, Let's identify startups that are on the ground doing it. Because you won't do it. I won't do it. Maybe there are people in offices who won't go down to the grassroots. But social entrepreneurs devote themselves, and they are the ones that are providing solutions in places where the government and bureaucracies have failed, and they need empowerment. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Very clear. Let's ask the same thing to uh, another uh, euh, panéliste du Sénégal, parce qu'elle travaille aussi avec les entreprises, les entrepreneurs en, au niveau local et aussi à la formation des entrepreneurs. Quelles sont vos considérations à ce propos Merci beaucoup. Alors, je vais commencer mon intervention par là où a terminé M. Koulibaly. Il dit en fait que les jeunes n'ont plus d'espoir et se retournent en fait euh, vers l arme, les armes. Nous, on a les armes positives, c'est-à-dire l'innovation dans la technologie. Et euh, les États n'ont pas pu réellement résoudre le problème de l'emploi des jeunes. En tant que jeunes, nous avons les solutions. Et j'en suis une, et je peux aussi citer tant d'autres jeunes qui sont en train aujourd'hui d'innover dans leur localité. 
dans leur communauté. Juste en identifiant un problème et en essayant de trouver la solution. La solution que j'ai mise en place, c'est une plateforme digitale euh, qui permet aux femmes transformatrices qui sont en milieu rural ou bien dans la capitale même, de pouvoir commercialiser leurs produits agricoles transformés et d'avoir une visibilité sur le marché national et international. Alors, c'est un constat que nous avons fait. Depuis des années, on parle d'agro-industrie, d'agroalimentaire au Sénégal ou bien partout ailleurs dans les pays en Afrique, mais il n'y a jamais eu de solution pour adresser en fait l'accès au marché. Avec la technologie, nous sommes arrivés à créer une plateforme digitale qui leur permette de vendre. Et depuis trois ans, nous travaillons avec 15 PME de femmes transformatrices qui regroupent plus de 2500 femmes qui commercialisent leurs produits agricoles à Dakar, euh, dans la diaspora et même en Asie. Donc, ça, ce sont des solutions concrètes qu'actuellement, des jeunes entrepreneurs sont en train de mettre en place grâce à la technologie. L'autre chose que je fais à côté de cette activité entrepreneuriale, c'est que nous avons aussi mis en place euh, une association, bien un Agritech Up, pour les jeunes dans l'agroalimentaire, ou bien dans l'agriculture en général et la technologie. Et nous avons vu qu'il faudrait créer un link entre euh, les jeunes en milieu urbain et les jeunes en milieu rural. Nous avons été à l'école. Nous avons appris la plupart euh, la technologie. Nous avons la connaissance technique. Les jeunes en milieu rural n'ont pas la connaissance technique. Ils ont peut-être un savoir-faire en agriculture, mais ils ne savent pas comment valoriser cela. Alors, à travers cet agribusiness, Tech Up, qui s'appelle ISA Agri Up, nous avons donc mis en place des euh, formations et des sensibilisations pour les jeunes, pour leur permettre de comprendre comment utiliser aujourd'hui la technologie au service de leur entreprise ou bien de toutes les activités qu'ils sont en train de faire. Parce qu'il faut dire que les jeunes utilisent actuellement la technologie. Je fais pas mal de pays ou bien de régions au Sénégal et je me rends compte que partout où je pars, je, tous les jeunes sont connectés. Alors, Comment devrait-on utiliser ces technologies-là pour réellement développer nos sociétés C'est réellement cela la question euh, et cette opportunité qu'on doit en fait saisir, parce qu'on est à l'ère du numérique, on n'est plus à l'ère industrielle, on a vraiment besoin de, de matériel pour développer certaines choses. Juste avec la technologie, nous pouvons réellement révolutionner euh, l'Afrique. Et c'est effectivement ce qu'on est en train de faire, et c'est réel, c'est des cas qui sont là, qu'on peut citer. Merci. Donc... We are start having a series of answers here. The problem is there, but also the opportunity. To address those, we need a change in policy making. It cannot be any more sectoral, traditional application and execution of a supposed to work uh, development by itself. It needs a vision, it needs a plan, and it needs also an integrated action that we have abandoned, unfortunately, in the 60s. That's fine. But then, uh, uh, the, the thing I was reporting about Tunisia, saying maybe there is, uh, if we don't do it, there is a danger there, Ibrahima was much more explicit. He said, no, guys, it's not a, a generic uh, danger. Here, there are weapons. Here, there, are, there is uh, uh, security issues that are at the door. And who is going there are the youth. They don't have alternative. And therefore, we desperately need to do it quickly. But again, we need to change the operational mode for cooperation, international cooperation. It's not by just supporting a central government. And secondly, we need to uh, uh, strengthen and empower the communities. And then we hear, not only the communities, there are entrepreneurs there, there are young people that want to do things, and we can help them in, do in entering, in doing things. It's difficult. David was very explicit. We need to change mentality. There are several constraints. Uh, in the OECD Development Center, we do this SIGI, Social, uh, Social Institution um, Gender Index, where we show that in reality, the gender condition very often is determined by traditions and social institution that see women in a certain way. So it's a difficult struggle. It's not easy to do. But then from Senegal, it comes also Something is also changing because there are technologies, and we know about the, tele the, the, te the telebanking and everything that is happening in Africa. So there are some elements of answer in this discussion. I would like now to call into the game Nestlé. Why? Because uh, in the debate that we are having, that I am having with uh, the chief economist of the World Bank or the chief economist of the African Development Bank, very often there is this idea that the solution may come by creating special mechanisms to attract 
important foreign direct investments that may spill over and spread development over time. And therefore, uh, as it happened for China, that is the big phenomenon of development, uh, probably in the history of development, uh, then we may think, well, if there are some foreign direct investment that come, they, can, they could provide from this side uh, some uh, uh, incentives or inputs and create jobs. What Nestlé, is Nestlé connected? Ta -da -da. Yes, uh, very, very good afternoon. Okay. Yes, we are connected. What uh, do you think? Yeah. Well, first of all, I would like to welcome everybody also. Uh, good afternoon. And uh, I'm extremely happy to join you and to share our private enterprise perspective to all the questions that have been raised so far. And I have also to say that I'm sharing most of the comments I have listened from all the five of you. It is not about the what. I think the what has clearly been defined, but it is about the how. And why does we as a company are so much into uh, this, uh, I what we call uh, the Global Youth Initiative that has been started a few years ago, where we really have a very big ambition to make sure that 10 million young people around the globe, not only in Africa, but I will specifically talk about Africa, uh, will be enabled really to join an economic activity. Doesn't mean that we put all the jobs on the table, but we want to enable young people to be part of an economic activity. And we are talking about food. We're talking about a population growth. And everybody tells us how much more we have to produce in Africa just to feed the local population. But if everybody is going away from rural areas into urban centers, my very simple question is, who is going to grow that food? And that is one of the reasons why we at Nestle, we have mainly in Africa, we have set up a industrial footprint where most of our factories are located in rural areas by design. And why? Because we want to be close to producers to make sure that we get good raw materials, local raw materials to those factories to serve them, the consumers mainly in urban centers where you also have a higher power, uh, purchasing power. And when I go back, you know, to what has been said, what do we do and how do we do that? I think it is mainly that companies like ours, we can really link farmers to markets. And that is extremely important because once you buy local ingredients, and we do buy a lot of local ingredients, most of our ingredients for all the Nestle products on the continent in Africa are locally sourced. And that creates the reversal of a cash flow from urban centers to rural areas. And this cash flow also creates, as has been said, it's not about agriculture only, but it's about creating other jobs in rural areas. Those who fix a bicycle, those he, who provide a transportation, those who may provide also education or medical services. Once you have cash, in rural areas, then things start really to develop. And I think in this sense, uh, it's extremely important that obviously as a company, you cannot do everything alone. You need to be embedded into the local uh, governmental entities who will be very important to establish the framework conditions like road systems, a big issue in African agriculture is that it is not the agriculture uh, part only, but it is mainly how do I reach really my final consumer. And therefore, it's about logistics, it's about transport, it's about transportation costs per se, and so on and so forth. And it's mainly also about security. But we have trained over the last five, six years in Africa probably more than 400,000 smallholder farmers. And out of these smallholder farmers, we are now engaging into making some of them, several, maybe five, 6,000 farmers, so-called agripreneurs, agricultural entrepreneurs. 
these agricultural entrepreneurs, they're building up cases, new business models, where in fact they should become lighthouses and to show in villages, to show in rural communities how things may change. Because also the fact uh, that uh, someone mentioned about the connectivity, it is amazing how important today communication has evolved in Africa much more than in many other continents, and that is exactly where we have to build on. But it's not only about communication and information, it's about also having the physical stuff shifted from rural areas, as I said, to factories, finished products, then to consumers, mainly in rural areas. So in that sense, I think that there is a great opportunity working together with many local uh, entities, with the government, obviously, but also NGOs, and not only having one company, but having many companies going in the same direction. I think we have in the case of uh, Cote d'Ivoire, uh, we have that also in, uh, in Ghana, we have that in many uh, Eastern African countries where we are working together even with competitors on rural development topics. And I think this is one of the, the way forward to be part of a solution to make agriculture again attractive for young, talented people, because if the brain drain continues, in Africa, as it is the case today, then I'm not so sure if we can really feed Africa with African agriculture only in 10, 20 years from now. And this is a very humble contribution from, from a company like ours, but we would like to engage more other companies to follow the same path and learning together to be really part of solutions locally. Because for me, the local, local, once again, local solution is the first start because also in the Western world over the last hundred years, it was not only the globalization who developed everything. No, globalization came after a very strong local rural economy. Thank you, Hans. Now, okay, we have heard several uh, interventions and there is a logic here that we, is appearing. Now I can take three questions from the floor. I have already one here, and then we will see how to address our panelists. Uh, microphone. Okay, here. Anybody else? Has we, I have one and, and two. Okay. So we have already a three. You can now relax and continue. Okay. Bonjour, merci. Uh, C'est très très bien d'être là. Je suis très heureux parce que j'entends des choses qui sont formidables. Nous parlons des enfants. Des, des vous des... présenter, monsieur, s'il vous plaît Pardon Je suis Cheikh Keïta, je suis président de Sidiga African Network Fund, c'est un fonds d'investissement pour l'Afrique, et de Bridge of Innovation. C'est une société qui euh, recherche des start-up innovantes en Afrique et qui les aide à aller sur le marché. Merci beaucoup. Euh, on parle de la jeunesse et des perspectives d'avenir. Euh, je voudrais poser deux questions. Euh, L'Afrique est un grand continent, un très beau continent, qui, qui avance avec succès, mais avec beaucoup de problématiques. Euh, demain, c'est l'avenir avec les jeunes, mais aujourd'hui, c'est l'avenir avec les jeunes aussi. Parce qu'il faut penser que maintenant, c'est maintenant qu'il faut trouver des solutions. Alors la première question, alors, on demande souvent aux, aux jeunes euh, d'être entrepreneurs. Mais quand ils sont entrepreneurs, ils sont face à des multiples problèmes, que les États ne règlent pas souvent au départ. Alors, vous allez aller à la banque, la banque va vous étaler les problématiques, 15% taux de crédit et plus. Alors, un jeune qui veut investir, un jeune qui veut innover, qui veut créer son entreprise, il se trouve devant un mur. Alors, premièrement, est-ce qu'on ne peut pas penser à une politique de subvention Vous savez, il y a des États qui importent du riz, qui importent du ciment, qui importent euh, des matières premières, dont qui n'ont pas le prix sur le marché. Alors, ils ont des subventions. Est-ce qu'on ne peut pas passer okay. pour, pour l'entrepreneur Ça, c'est la première question. La deuxième question, il faut passer au système de, de, de fiscalisation. Est-ce qu'on ne peut pas penser que finalement, nous pouvons réguler la donne fiscale, c'est-à-dire, on donne la possibilité aux jeunes qui créent les entreprises, de en leur mettant en bas fiscalement, jusqu'à ce qu'ils puissent arriver euh, sur le marché Et troisièmement, s'il vous plaît, la Alors, troisième question. Trois questions. Je demandais pour toi. <rire> déjà, vous avez pris deux. 
Alors, la troisième question, elle est la suivante. Nous avons assez de problèmes. Alors, est-ce qu'on ne peut pas imaginer une banque euh, pour suivre les entrepreneurs, l'entrepreneuriat et l'innovation en Afrique Merci beaucoup, monsieur. So, we have three here. Uh, one, uh, the question was there. I, I had... Non, 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 vous, vous. Il y avait le deuxième, monsieur. Attendez, madame, un instant, d'abord, monsieur, et après... Si vous, vous êtes bref, on peut prendre euh, quatre personnes. Mais si vous, chacun il me pose 14 questions, c'est difficile. Peut-être que je ne vais pas être bref, mais je vais dire des choses importantes. Ouais. <rire> il peut rien. En tout cas, je m'appelle Ibrahim El Ali. J'ai beaucoup travaillé en Afrique, au Sénégal, au Mali particulièrement. Mais je voudrais souligner qu'on attend beaucoup des États là où ils ont en réalité, comme vous l'avez souligné, très, très peu de moyens financiers. Nos États africains ont très, très peu de taxes fiscales, vous l'avez souligné. La solution en Afrique, en tout cas, elle ne passera pas forcément par les États. Mais la jeune dame qui a parlé tout à l'heure et la ministre également, ils ont souligné un aspect très important, c'est le foncier. Maintenant, la technologie, elle permet avec le blockchain de pouvoir regarder, régler la question tout de suite foncière un peu à travers toute l'Afrique, avec les nouvelles technologies, pour pouvoir voir où c'est qu'il y a des problèmes on les laisse pour un, un litige et où il n'y a pas de problème, qu'on fasse au moins le titre foncier. Dans des pays comme le Mali, on peut avoir des maires qui vendent trois ou quatre ou cinq fois un même terrain et il y a d'énormes difficultés sur la question foncière dans nos pays et il faut utiliser la nouvelle technologie pour commencer. Pour un deuxième point rapide et je laisse la parole à d'autres. Un deuxième point, c'est l'éducation dans les campagnes. Il n'y aura pas de développement sans qu'il y ait un développement rural, effectivement, mais aussi des villes moyennes. Vous, vous l'avez souligné avec l'histoire des tâches de Léopard. Si la migration, elle est tout pour la capitale, on va avoir une désertification de l'intérieur et, et un encombrement dans la, dans la ville capitale qui, qui n'aura pas de solution non plus. Donc le développement passe par les villes moyennes et, et effectivement, moi j'ai été au Mali. J'ai été au Mali, j'ai été dans des provinces à, à, à 17 km de Kati. J'ai vu des enfants, des enfants qui ont 6 et 12 ans. Ils savaient aller à l'agriculture, ils allaient aller faire à l'élevage, ils allaient faire creuser un puits pour chercher de l'eau. Ils avaient un savoir empirique extraordinaire, traditionnel, mis par leurs parents. Mais dès qu'ils partaient à l'école, à 15 km où ils marchaient à pied, ils étaient déconnectés, il y avait une fracture éducationnelle. Et cette école ne leur servait à rien. Le ministre de Côte d'Ivoire était là ce matin, mais il y a des médecins qui sortent d'Abidjan qui n'ont même pas de travail. Ce que je veux dire, c'est que l'éducation doit ramener les centres de formation de l'agriculture vers les campagnes. Pour que ces jeunes-là, qui partaient faire une éducation à 17 km, qui ne servent à rien, au moins qu'ils puissent faire du goutte à goutte, utiliser leur environnement, de telle sorte que le développement passe par là. Et ça ne sera pas seulement l'agriculture, vous l'avez souligné, monsieur, ça sera un développement intégré, intégré de vie, de vie comme ici on parle de, 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 des quartiers qui sont morts là-bas, les campagnes doivent revivre à travers la culture, à travers ouais. tout un environnement. Ouais. Bah vous savez, des fois, je me dis, le, le CDE est, est à Paris parce que les économistes sont un petit peu comme les, les tailleurs. On fait de la mode. Alors là, maintenant, il y a la mode des grandes villes. On oublie que l'Allemagne n'a pas de grandes villes, métropole. On oublie que l'Italie n'a pas la même structure urbaine. En Italie, que, on, on oublie que l'Espagne n'a pas. Donc, l'équivalence grande ville développement Bon, elle n'est pas prouvée, ni par la géographie, ni par les faits. Donc, euh, l'importance des villes moyennes est cruciale. D'autant plus que ça permet de faire des centres de gros, des centres de distribution. L'énergie, la distribution, Internet, ce n'est rien que des multi-réseaux, et c'est ça le développement. Ouais, une communauté rurale oui. a toujours une ville à l'intérieur. Et l'État ne, ne servira qu'à mesurer le développement de la jeunesse voilà. et des femmes, et non pas Écoutez, faire des lois. Écoutez, on parce est que... les deux des Méditerranéennes, oui. on pourrait continuer toute non, la journée je... comme ça. <rire> non je, je termine juste par une, une phrase. Euh, une phrase. Euh. Ce que je veux dire, ça veut dire que l'aspect juridique, que ce soit les accords de partenariat économique, les accords de Cotonou, même les Chinois, dans leurs accords avec l'Afrique, ils intègrent toujours le développement de la jeunesse et des femmes. Bon. Et les chartes africaines des droits de l'homme l'intègrent aussi. Donc, bon. ce n'est pas une question juridique, c'est une question de réalité sur le terrain. Euh, comme je les, suis d'accord avec vous. Je comprends un petit peu moins, même les Chinois. Je dis les Chinois, ils sont très corrects. Hein. Okay. Oui. Vous avez vu, j'ai été court. Merci. Oui. Euh, Dalmeda Josepha. Voilà, moi, je voudrais poser juste une question. Euh, Merci. Je sais que la terre africaine est très bonne. C'est une très bonne terre. Et je vois depuis quelques années des, des étrangers investir l'Afrique. La question que je voudrais poser, est-ce que le contrat est gagnant-gagnant Ou alors, euh, nos pauvres agriculteurs sont pénalisés Ou bien ils sont intégrés à ces programmes pleinement et éventuellement avec les jeunes. Deuxième question, je, 
Oui, oui, bon, c'est juste une constatation en fait. Je ne sais pas s'il y a une solution à ça. Euh, je vois qu'il y a beaucoup de, de chantiers ruraux euh, dans nos pays d'Afrique. Et mon constat est que c'est souvent les étrangers qui participent. Les, euh, en fait, les, comment peut-on dire, les Africains eux-mêmes n'y vont pas. C'est très, très rare. Et je voudrais savoir s'il y a une possibilité, s'il y a un moyen de, de les faire venir, parce que c'est notre avenir, en fait. Si Merci. les jeunes y participent, les jeunes de notre, en fait, Merci. y participent. Merci. On a une dernière question. Au moins une, j'espère. Non, mais, ah, est, il est jeune, lui. Thank you. Moi aussi. <laughs> Je so, suis un ancien jeune. Je parle speak anglais. So, mon nom est Prince. Et uh, ma question est à David et Awa. And it's it's on what Hans said. He said we know the what. Now we need to figure out the how. So in your opinion, David, working with grassroots and as well as our working with GIZ and and, and and stuff like that. In your opinion, how how do we move beyond the rhetoric of such meetings to get down to the grassroots to make the needed impact? Okay. So we have heard uh, questions of different nature. Uh, incentives, fiscal reduction. Uh, uh, these are more traditional measures from the center. Then we have heard uh, a series of questions concerning planning, middle-sized uh, middle cities and not only urban areas. What makes a rural community lively, really? And then we have heard about how to implement. Uh, from here, uh, invited last week, Esther Duflo, she was saying, The economists should think to themselves as plumber, not as, uh, because they very often is the detail that matters in the implementation of the policy. So, uh, who wants to answer? Here, go. Je vais répondre à la question de Monsieur Koulibaly et puis passer à l'autre question. Monsieur Koulibaly, effectivement, vous avez cité euh, des fonds d'investissement, vous avez. Keita, désolé, Monsieur Koulibaly, désolé. <rire> Keita, donc vous avez cité en fait qu'il faudrait euh, mettre en place des fonds d'investissement et une subvention. J'ai bénéficié d'une subvention au Sénégal quand j'ai démarré mes activités d'entrepreneur. Malheureusement, il n'y a pas eu de suivi. Donc aujourd'hui, je ne sais même pas si le gouvernement sénégal est capable de dire que j'ai pu réellement réaliser les activités que je suis en train de faire grâce à, au fonds d'amorçage que j'ai reçu en 2014. L'idée m'est venue bien avant, en 2011, mais réellement, pour mettre cela en place, il m'a fallu effectivement un fonds. Mais je ne sais pas. Je suis plus connue à l'échelle internationale qu'à l'échelle nationale. Et c'est la triste réalité, malheureusement. Et je vais en profiter pour répondre à l'autre question, le comment. C'est de s'inspirer de ce qu'on est en train de faire. J'entends tout le temps les mêmes discours. Je participe à beaucoup de panels et je me rends compte depuis trois ans on parle de la même chose. Nous qui sommes sur le terrain en train de faire de belles choses, nous ne sommes pas assez valorisés. Les stratégies ou bien les politiques des États ne nous intègrent pas réellement. Et pourtant, on est en train de résoudre des problèmes cruciaux que depuis des années, ils sont en train de voir comment résoudre cela. Donc j'ai mal. Ma vision à moi, c'est de mettre en place une plateforme digitale, panafricaine, des produits agricoles transformés. Et cela répond aussi à la problématique de la culture. Nos produits ne sont pas assez connus. Nos produits ne sont pas consommés. Nous avons énormément de produits qui viennent d'extérieur, de l'extérieur. Alors, si on veut réellement garder cette culture et cette identité, que ce soit culturelle ou bien dans l'agriculture, il faudrait qu'on puisse réellement travailler sur notre propre économie et l'agribusiness, l'agroalimentaire. Donc, je parle du fond du cœur. J'espère que tous les gouvernants ici présents sont en train de m'entendre parce que, je porte aussi la voix de plusieurs jeunes Sénégalais, ou bien même Africains, qui ont les mêmes problématiques. L'accès au financement, le fait d'être reconnu réellement. Alors, la seule recommandation que je, je voudrais faire, en fait, c'est de vraiment s'inspirer de toutes les activités que nous sommes en train de faire pour l'intégrer dans les politiques de développement. Merci beaucoup. Merci. Madame la ministre. Merci. Nous reconnaissons que euh, notre jeunesse a le potentiel. Nous avons des potentialités agricoles. Mais je pense que le, le grand défi, c'est d'avoir l'audace de conduire des changements profonds, même dans nos propres comportements. Je voudrais donner un exemple. Dans nos sociétés africaines, nous consommons tous le pain. 
le pain qui est fabriqué avec la farine de blé qui est importée. Donc, nous faisons travailler des jeunes d'autres pays pour produire ce, cette farine de blé et nous, nous, nous utilisons cette farine de blé pour produire notre pain. Alors, là où je parle de changement, pourquoi ne pas réfléchir à utiliser le manioc que nos jeunes, que nos mamans produisent, les transformer, produire le pain pour pouvoir développer cette chaîne de valeur. Ça, c'est du concret. Et ça interpelle d'abord les, les gouvernants crédits pour, pour dire, voilà, dorénavant, nous réduisons l'importation de la farine de blé, on peut, ça peut être progressif, et nous encourageons l'utilisation du cassava, du manioc. Et vous allez voir, parce que je sais qu'un pays l'a fait, le Nigeria l'a fait, même ceux qui importaient de grandes choses se sont reconvertis à, en accompagnant les coopératives agricoles. Et là, on produit beaucoup de manioc, ça fait travailler les jeunes, ils sont entrepreneurs agricoles, on fait de la transformation et toute la communauté, toute la communauté euh, consomme le, le pain à base du, du manioc. Ça, c'est un exemple. Et vous voyez que ça fait développer toute la chaîne de valeur. Et ça pose le problème du financement dont M. Keta vient de parler. Effectivement, si vous n'avez pas un mécanisme de financement intégré qui rassure et l'investisseur, et la banque, et le jeune entrepreneur, ce sera du fiasco. Au Togo, par exemple, nous avions euh, développé, nous avons des fonds qui accompagnent les jeunes de bout en bout. Ils ont eu des financements, ils sont devenus entrepreneurs, ils font des choses merveilleuses comme vous, madame. Mais on s'est rendu compte que c'est de la pluie très cloisonné et ça ne produit pas l'impact recherché. Et donc, si nous sommes dans la logique de chaîne de valeur, il faut un fonds intégré qui mitige les risques et qui rassure tout le monde. Et si Dieu le veut, d'ici la fin de l'année, nous, on aura ce fonds-là intégrateur et qui permet à n'importe qui veut intervenir sur une chaîne de valeur de dire, je peux avoir le financement, je peux avoir la facilitation, je peux avoir la garantie. Et donc, ça rassure les uns les autres. Parce qu'il y en a qui sont en amont, il y en a qui sont en aval. Et il y a un lien entre les différentes chaînes de, de valeur. Et c'est ce qu'il faut. Un fonds intégrateur, je suis d'accord avec vous. Il faut aussi des mesures discriminatoires positives à l'endroit des jeunes et des femmes. Ce que nous avons eu à faire cette année, par exemple, peut-être qu'on a été bien inspiré aussi, c'est que le gouvernement a décidé d'octroyer 20 des marchés publics aux femmes et aux jeunes. Marché public. Donc, n'importe qui veut euh, faire euh, euh, une commande de marché public doit réserver 20 un quota de 20 aux jeunes et aux femmes. Et cela nous amène à quoi À définir les goulots d'étranglement. On s'est rendu compte que même le jeune, même malgré cette facilité, le jeune ne peut pas parce qu'il a des problèmes avec la banque pour, pour apporter des garanties. Le jeune n'a pas l'information. Donc, ça nous a poussé à créer un guichet unique entrepreneur pour les 20 justement, parce que nous voulons mettre en œuvre les 20 et aller, pourquoi pas, à 30 à 50 Parce que les jeunes, ils ont la volonté, ils ont le potentiel, mais il faut des facilités. Et je pense que ce genre de facilité, ça répond un peu aux préoccupations que les uns et les autres ont. C'est ce que je voulais juste partager avec vous. Merci, Madame la Ministre. David, vous avez demandé directement. So, right, um, J'ai une noble réponse. Et vous savez, je suis un farmer. Et il y a deux grands déterminants dans l'agriculture c'est le temps et le politicien. Avec le temps, Today, there, there are apps, we can predict it, although there is climate change. But then the politician is a big determinant because we don't know what he will say next, what he will stop doing, and what he won't do. And I think we need to inspire the legislature, the politician, to put up the right laws. And rule of law is something that we all have to respect. In as much as we are improving situations in the city, we must improve situations in the rural area with respect to the fact that all are equi um, created equal and all must, um, you know, have access to the same standard of living or quality of life. If we want freedom, equality, equity, justice, probity, and accountability, these things must be promoted. To answer Prince's question, I think that inspiration begets inspiration. I believe that there are lots of rich people, influential people that can put up businesses in the rural areas to help people to have jobs and have different, decent li lifestyles. Before coming here, I realized that two years ago, or just last year, a bag of cassava cost about $40 in Ghana. Prior to my coming, a bag of cassava cost $10. So if a farmer puts so much efficiency input into growing his land, you know, for cassava, he's going to lose. He can't pay his child school fees. He can't pay back his loans or credits. 
or access to what he, how he access microfinance, he can pay back. And I believe that some of us must be inspired to put up um, solutions to some of these. So I thought of a Gary processing factory. It doesn't cost so much to do. Some $30,000 could do this. And we don't need a World Bank to do this. It's a business. A young man, a simple man, an entrepreneur identifies this opportunity, creates an effective demand how he can export this to maybe Dubai or somewhere else and puts up a simple thing or two that can process the Gary, process it, and um, sell to the local people themselves or even have to export to the bigger cities. And I affirm that inspiration begets inspiration. You know, back in the day, prior to finishing my master's, the narrative is that people that are aged, about 50, would do farming. I didn't know at 25 I could do it. I believed I could do it because I had seen somebody do it. Then my motive changed into how I could raise money to start a farm in Ghana. So after writing, I turned down a number of job um, offers in international development to start a farm in Ghana. That was in 2014. What I'm, to what I'm talking about is if the politician is inspired to make the right laws such that it will favor startups, it will favor the entrepreneur on waiting taxes, the entrepreneur is um, inspired to put up the right business, I believe that young people can access this. And let us stop the hypocrisy of trying to stop people from migrating to um, cities. You can box people. You can build a Mexican wall around rural areas like Trump that he shouldn't get out of it. But then if we put up the right stuff in the rural areas, they will stay. Education, entertainment, so that they can have a better livelihood as well. Thank you. Thank you, David. <laughs> I'm sorry with you, uh, Jan, uh, with Ansior because uh, I, I received signal of a plane that is going to land here if we don't finish immediately. So let me uh, just ask uh, uh, our friends uh, Ibrahim Koulibaly to say a few words to conclude. Merci beaucoup. Uh, je vais commencer par la question de Madame Dalmeda qui a parlé de uh, d'investissement dans la terre en Afrique. La question a été abordée par Madame la Ministre et puis d'autres personnes. Euh, je pense que c'est une question extrêmement importante et cruciale. Et dans la plupart des pays africains, il n'y a pas une politique foncière agricole. Et donc, c'est ça qui est le problème. Parce que comme il n'y a pas une vraie politique de foncier agricole, le foncier est un, est, est un capital important et dont les gens ne veulent, ne veulent pas discuter. Parce que beaucoup de terres sont concentrées par les gens qui sont au pouvoir. Et donc, si on veut parler des terres, des réformes de la question de, terre, de la terre, on pose des problèmes compliqués. Et donc, c'est ce qui fait que beaucoup de pays n'ont pas de problèmes. Donc, ce qui fait que quand les, les, les investisseurs étrangers viennent dans la plupart de nos pays, ils vont directement à la présidente de la République. Et donc, et on les envoie prendre des terres directement chez les communautés. C'est comme ça que ça s'est passé au Mali ou dans d'autres pays, après la crise alimentaire de 2008. Nous nous sommes battus contre ça. Aujourd'hui, c'est un phénomène qui baisse. Mais donc, en réalité, les communautés ne sont pas impliquées. Ou alors, on les instrumentalise. C'est-à-dire qu'on va voir le, le chef du village avec ses conseillers, on leur donne de l'argent... Et puis, ils commencent à parler au nom de la communauté sans avoir fait des réunions avec les gens. Donc, c'est vraiment, ce n'est pas ça la solution. Vraiment, je suis formel là-dessus parce que nous nous sommes beaucoup battus contre ça au Mali et on a eu des résultats. On a pu faire reculer des investissements. Donc, ce n'est pas ça qui va développer l'Afrique. L'Afrique, la, notre responsabilité de développement, c'est nous-mêmes. Si on n'a pas compris ça, on n'ira nulle part. Maintenant, les success stories, il y en a plein. Des, comme Mme Kaba, comme David, il y en a. Ce n'est pas ça qui manque. Nous, on, a des centres, on forme des jeunes ruraux qui sont en train de s'installer dans les petits, dans les filières économiques. Donc, mais qu est que, qui est-ce que ça intéresse dans les gouvernements Personne. Mais on n'ira jamais à échelle sans un, un État qui fonctionne. C'est-à-dire qu'il faut être clair sur ça. Si la France est là aujourd'hui parce qu'il y a eu un État fort, si la Chine est en train d'écraser tout le monde, c'est parce qu'il y a un État. Trump aujourd'hui. Voilà. C'est-à-dire tout le monde veut un État fort sauf, sauf l'Afrique. On ne voit pas émerger un État qui fonctionne en Afrique. Et c'est triste. Donc, ce n'est pas des succès touristes qui vont nous développer. Elle, elle va gérer 2 000 personnes, peut-être dans 10 ans, elle aura 10 000 personnes, mais il y, y, y a 5 millions de femmes au Sénégal. Donc, comment on fait pour qu'un nombre de plus en plus important, ça ne peut pas se faire quand l'État est là pour dire toujours, on n'a pas l'argent, on n'a pas l'argent. Mais ce n'est pas vrai. Vous voyez le train de vie de nos administrations C'est un scandale. Non, c'est un scandale, tout le monde le sait. Aujourd'hui, il y a un débat en Afrique sur les, les perdièmes des fonctionnaires que, qui a été fixé par tous les gouvernements à plus de 100 euros par jour. Mais quels sont les... Je vous dis, vous allez dans un village en Afrique, vous ne trouverez pas cinq familles qui peuvent avoir économisé 100 euros par, par an. Par an, j'ai dit, ce n'est pas par, par mois, hein, par an, sur le revenu agricole. Mais on donne 100 euros aux fonctionnaires par jour pour se déplacer dans leur propre pays. 
et on dit qu'il n'y a pas l'argent. Et le bailleur de fonds met l'argent dans l'aide budgétaire qui fonctionne, c'est là. Toujours il n'y a pas l'argent, toujours il y a... Mais on prend des impôts, on prend l'aide au développement, on prend l'aide budgétaire, on prend tout. Et on dit toujours il n'y a pas l'argent. Si il n'y a pas la volonté de partager, c'est ça qui est, qui est la triste réalité. Donc, il faut changer cela. Nous, on est des enfants de, ces, de nos pays, on a les mêmes droits que les ministres, que les présidents. Et même on peut briguer ces magistratures, s'il le faut. Mais ce n'est pas ça la question. Il faut regarder les gens qui se battent sur le terrain avec notre regard. C'est ce que nous demandons. Nous, on ne veut pas faire la politique, on, ça, on sait pas, mais il faut que ceux qui sont fonds de la politique, qui prennent le pouvoir en Afrique, comprennent qu'ils ne pourront pas continuer à gérer comme ça encore longtemps. Ce n'est pas possible. Parce que les choses ont changé, les données ont changé. Et s'ils ne voient pas ça, donc tous les instruments financiers, taxation, tout ça, mais on les a. On n'a qu'à l'appliquer. Le titre foncier dont madame, euh, quelqu'un a parlé. Mais vous savez que sur le titre foncier au Mali, il n'y a pas d'impôt. Comment vous pouvez comprendre ça Parce que ce sont les fonctionnaires, les gens riches des villes qui ont des titres fonciers. Aucun paysan ne peut avoir un titre foncier. Donc ils ne mettent pas d'impôts parce que c'est eux qui vont payer ces impôts-là. Si on taxe le, le foncier aujourd'hui, on va avoir des milliards. Tout le monde le sait. Mais pourquoi on ne on taxe pas Merci. Merci beaucoup. Thank you to all participants. Thank you to Ancion that was uh, uh, in, in connection by air. Thank you to the participation. Now it's time for your coffee break. Take your time. You can speak with the people here. No violent objection, please, but just discussion. Thank you. Bye. Thank you. Thank you. Merci beaucoup. Nous avons 20 minutes pour prendre un café. Nous nous retrouvons ici un petit peu avant moins le quart pour parler du, de, de, de la politique des genres dans les situations de conflit et fragiles. A tout de suite. Fabrizio, Fabrizio, are you still with me? Hello, Fabrizio. Ladies and ladies and gentlemen, welcome back. This is. Um, the last mile of our Global Forum on Development 2018 on the power of four billion. Our session now, session three, is on gender equality and women's empowerment in fragile and conflict-affected contexts. So please take your seats and uh, brace yourselves for another exciting discussion. Um, let me remind you also that there will be uh, questions and answers uh, during the session but that you are still welcome to share your questions and comments with us on social media using the Slido, S-L-I-D-O uh, website, because these questions can be filtered to our moderator. Speaking of which, let me now turn to the moderator of session three. Uh, he is Jorge Moreira da Silva. He is the director of the Development Cooperation Directorate of the OECD. Jorge, please uh, lead us into the discussion and introduce your panelists. Merci beaucoup, Henri Bernard. Thank you very much. I would like to, to uh, introduce our, our panelists and uh, inviting them to join me in the, in the stage. Um, I'd like to invite uh, Her Excellency, uh, the First Lady of Renaissance, uh, Madame Rulagani, uh, Her Royal Highness Princess Abze Chigma from Burkina Faso, um, Mrs. Karin uh, Jemtin, Director General uh, from the CEDA and former Minister on uh, International Development from Sweden. Uh, Kavinci Malu, Director for Gender at UN uh, World Food Program from Kenya. And uh, Noella uh, Mua Mizri, uh, Girl Ambassador for Peace from Global Network of Women Peace Builders from the Democratic Republic of uh, Congo. Well, I'd like to, to thank you for your uh, presence. It will be, uh, I'm sure, a very interesting and lively uh, discussion. Um, we started uh, um, this morning already with, with uh, uh, two other uh, panels. Uh, and, I'm, and I'm sure at this panel we will be able not only to focus on uh, uh, gender equality and women uh, empowerment in uh, conflict and fragility context, but also to uh, uh, link this discussion with the main findings that we uh, got from the other from the other panels. Uh, I've just checked that I don't have my talking points, which is <laughs> a very uh, serious uh, matter of concern. I left it. I'm very sorry. I left it in the 
in the in the room when we were preparing the when we were preparing this uh, this discussion. Um, one of the big challenges will be about managing time. That's why we met uh, before to ensure that we would have uh, the possibility not only to have the first statements from uh, our distinguished guests, but also to have a, a lively interaction with uh, all of you. Um, at this session, as I mentioned, we would like to uh, focus on, on uh, this specific context of gender equality and women empowerment in conflict and, and, and fragility. Uh, this is very much linked with the work that uh, at OECD we have developed uh, um, between GenderNet and uh, INCAF. Uh, but I would like to emphasize the why. Why is OECD uh, uh, focusing on this um, perspective? Uh, nowhere are women at a greater disadvantage than in uh, fragile and conflict-affected uh, country contexts? And nowhere is, uh, is it more important, important for the international community to ensure uh, women and girls full access to opportunities and rights? Not only because um, by 2030, more than half of the world's poor will live in conflict-affected fragile states, but also because uh, our reports and, and, and main findings outline that empowering uh, women and girls in conflict and fragile contexts can transform uh, vicious cir circles into virtuous ones, support inclusive societies, sustainable peace and economic and social development. A recent study from the International Peace Institute concluded that when uh, women are included in peace processes, there is a 35% increase in the strength of a peace agreement lasting at least 15 years. For this reason, uh, we are uh, seeing more uh, ODA, Official Development Assistance, uh, being directed to fragile and conflict-affected uh, countries each year. Um, the ODA targeting conflict and, and, and fragile context uh, is already uh, up to 60% of uh, overall ODA. But there is a great story here. In the uh, um, in the recent years, in the past eight years, um, uh, DAC donors have, uh, in support of gender equality and uh, women's empowerment in conflict countries, more than doubled. Uh, in 2015-16, uh, uh, 16 billion dollars uh, on average per year of DAC members were uh, targeting uh, um, uh, fragile settings focused on gender equality and uh, women's uh, empowerment. So I think that this could be an interesting topic for our discussion, but as we have mentioned very often, this is more than statistics, more than flows, more than figures and numbers. What is important is to assess the impact of these uh, 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 um, uh, projects and, and, and uh, to ensure that uh, we have more effective programming. Uh, our report uh, uh, provided some recommendations for the sake of time. I will not uh, go into these uh, recommendations, but I would say that the major recommendation or the main uh, 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 message is unequal gender relations can drive conflict and uh, violence, while women's active participation um, uh, contributes to uh, peace and resilience. Uh, I will avoid going to further details because we are here not to hear me but to hear our distinguished panelists. So I would like to, to start by uh, inviting um, the, uh, First Lady of Afghanistan, Madame Ghani, to uh, bring uh, her uh, experience. Uh, Madame Ghani is a true champion for advancing women's roles in Afghanistan, uh, in particular in the economic sector. Her tireless work um, uh, to challenge uh, uh, order in, in Afghanistan since 2014 has broken barriers and inspired uh, populations within Afghanistan, but also uh, uh, beyond Afghanistan. So we'd like to hear from you, not only about uh, the, the legislation, the framework that is addressing uh, uh, the way to overcome these barriers, but also, but also the difficulties and the opportunities that you are identifying in the implementation. The floor is yours. Thank you. Thank you for your introduction. Um, I promise that I will start my uh, my contribution with an anecdote. So um, it happens in a village, 
and there is a young man that tells another young man, I'm getting married. I'm getting married to the daughter of the head man. He says, oh, yes? He says, yes, my father and I discussed it. So it's almost done. He says, what remains? Well, we have to talk to the head man and his daughter. So basically, <laughs> um, this is how I think of the uh, laws that we have on the books in Afghanistan. We have very good laws. We have in the Constitution, we have Article 20 that says that uh, all Afghans, men and women, are equal. We have uh, a very, um, uh, very detailed uh, EVA law, uh, elimination of violence against women. Uh, we have uh, several uh, regulations about uh, harassment and things, but there, these are all on the books. And uh, um, the problem is the implementation. Um, what we also have is a polit political will at the top. Uh, my husband is definitely a person who believes that women can hold uh, decision-making uh, posts. <coughs> So what is happening? And this is here probably I'm going to make a very quick uh, uh, introduction about the situation in post-conflict and fragile states because this is what the distinction is between what we're going to be talking about today, now, and the talks that were happening this morning that were in more normal situation. Um, in a fragile, and post-conflict state, there's no social order. They've been through wars, through conflicts. The society, the traditional society is disintegrated, especially families, and in traditional societies, families are really the pillars of society. And when a family is broken, then the society also gets broken. And within families, the role of women in traditional families is very clear and respected. And when there are no longer families, the uh, women find themselves kind of drifting. Uh, at the same time, uh, a post-conflict situation has unstable political uh, society, which is divided uh, into continuously evolving political factions. You know, there was a civil war. That means that there were groups that were fighting each other and sometimes they ally each other with each other, sometimes they fight against each other. It's all the time changing. So there is a political instability that is pervasive. And uh, because of that, there's a loss of moral compass. That means that everybody's behavior is on survival mode. They're trying to keep alive. If it means that they have to kill somebody or they have to a step on the rights of somebody else or they have to do something terrible, doesn't matter, they're going to survive and that is their goal. So uh, it becomes, it translates into a mentality of violence. And it is within that mentality of violence that I understand the increase of violence against women in post-conflict countries. It's not just the women that are uh, exposed to violence, men too. And uh, um, maybe in uh, post-conflict countries, we cannot really separate that much women from men because the situation is the same. Like for example, our education system is not doing very well. We need to uh, increase, improve the education system, both for boys and for girls. We have to make sure that women and girls get, um, get a, um, a chance in access to all the services, but men and boys also. So in other words, this is a very messy situation. And by the same token, it's a situation ripe for change because everybody is tired of the uncertainty and the instability. Everybody says it's enough. Uh, I want also to... Um, mention something about the use of vocabulary. Um, there is a lot of mention of the word gender in all our discussions. This morning it was repeatedly used. Do you know that there are many uh, languages 
into which gender, the word gender, cannot be translated. In Dari, which is a la one of the languages that's spoken in Afghanistan, we say jandar. In Iranian Persian, apparently we cannot say jandar because it's an unmentionable word. Um, French say uh, parité entre les hommes et les femmes, which I think is much more accurate in the meaning it conveys. Uh, I was uh, talking to the number two of uh, um, the OECD who's Japanese. Uh, I'm sorry, I, Masabi uh, Chikono. And uh, uh, Mr. Kono told me that actually there is no word for gender in Japanese. So it does really raise a question as to how we are using this uh, word, left and right. I know that mostly in Afghanistan, people, when they, um, the word gender is mentioned, they think it pertains only to women. Gender issues becomes women issues. So uh, there is need to, uh, I'm, not, I don't, I'm not proposing anything, I'm just pointing to it. That there is need to find out what needs to be, how do, how do you have to use these words and to use them in a way that we can communicate with each other in a clearer way. Um, uh, the same thing is for uh, women's rights. I uh, uh, avoid using uh, women's rights when I'm in Afghanistan because if there is a man in the room, he will say, how about my rights? I much rather use human rights because both men and women are human beings and as such have human rights, as such are worthy of respect and should be mutual, there should be mutual respect between every human being, whether they're old, whether they're young, whether they're women or men. Okay, I don't think we should uh, belabor the point. Um, I want to say a few words about my personal situation, as you know, my husband was elected president three and a half years ago and suddenly I became a first lady. Nothing had prepared me for this and I was not prepared. I didn't have an agenda or anything. But I felt that uh, uh, I had some responsibilities to the people of the country. And uh, this is why I opened my doors. I have, uh, there is a certain procedure to go, uh, to come and visit me, but everybody is welcome. And eventually they make their way to my, uh, to my office. And um, I don't have any funds to distribute. I don't do politics, but I'm always ready to engage in discussions on social and economic issues. And I always make suggestions and never impose my way of doing. I'm encouraging people. I'm not telling them what to do because I don't know what their situation is. I don't live in their home. I don't know what are the problems they're faced with, what are their strengths, what are their weaknesses. They have to come to, to solution themselves. So I'm really much more like, you know, a, um, a mother. I'm sure there are lots of mothers in this, uh, in this hall lots of parents too, and when you're um, uh, grooming a child to grow into an adult, there is a point where you have to encourage and sit back and see the person grow. Because if you do all the work, it's, uh, uh, it's your work, it's not, they're not growing, they're just being under your, your impression. Another thing I have discovered is that because of my position, I had the power of convening that means I can bring people together. And uh, uh, one of the things that have, uh, um, have helped me a lot is that every year we organize a symposium for Afghan women. And uh, there are 300 of them. And we discuss one topic. And uh, the first year we discuss the role of women in Afghan society because I wanted to show that we did have women that understood and were capable of discussion and we're capable of showing knowledge in so many different subjects. We had 10 panels that day. It was really great. The second year, we talked about social peace because yes, in a post-conflict situation, you are yearning for peace. But I think we can start within our own household, within our own families. Social peace is peace among Afghans. 
why do we have Afghans committing violence against other Afghans? So that was extremely important. And this year we're going to do it on responsible uh, citizenship. That will happen next May. Accomplishments, you asked me for accomplishments and challenges. Um, first of all, I'm not the only um, actor of change in Afghanistan. There are a lot of other people that are working and that are getting results. Uh, I'm more like a catalyst. Uh, one uh, a visible uh, accomplishment is that Afghan women are much more visible. They are in all uh, sectors of society. We do have them in the government, we do have them in the private sector, we do have more professors, more doctors, more lawyers, more judges. And um, the other change that I uh, really think is extremely important is there is a change in the attitude towards education. There was, some 10 years ago, there was a reluctance to send your children to school. What is school going to do for them? Well, my husband was visiting uh, a province uh, a week ago, and uh, he went there, and people were very happy to see him. And uh, as you know, my husband was in academics, so he really uh, spent a lot of time getting an education. And he came back and he told me it was really very interesting. All the elders were saying, we want to send our children to school because we want them to be like you. So now they really understand the worth of education. And uh, another thing that gives me a lot of hope is that the rising generation, the young people, which you talk about uh, this morning, there was a whole session on them, the young people are really very determined to make a go of it. They really tell me, one girl told me, Afghanistan is like a sick person and we need to treat it, we need to make it better, we need to heal it. Uh, they are very uh, eager to take part. As somebody else said this morning, uh, they don't want to be the generation of the future, they want to be the generation of today. And this is really very true in Afghanistan. And fortunately, um, the president who uh, was a professor at the university loves to have young people uh, participate and we have different kinds of uh, shuras, uh, which means uh, councils dis where you discuss things. And uh, uh, often young people are invited to come and take part in the discussions. Challenges. Um, locally, I mean, within Afghanistan. A, um, one challenge is changing the mentality from the reign of violence, which I spoke about earlier, uh, into a culture of uh, peaceful interaction, meditation, uh, mediation, sorry, and mutual respect. Another one is changing the mentality of corruption and warlordism. The third one is changing the mentality from dependency on foreign aid to sustainable endeavors. And that's a very important one as far as I'm concerned. Um, internationally, one challenge you might be surprised is the negative media. And why I'm saying that? Because it is fueled in part by international aid agencies who are competing for funds from donor countries. So whenever it is a season to go around with your begging bowl and ask for more funds, you, call, you, you say, oh my God, you should see these women in Afghanistan, they're in terrible condition, they are, it's the worst place uh, to be a woman in the world, and all these kind of uh, cliches that are not necessarily accurate, but will raise money. So negative media is um, it's something that uh, international should try and refrain from. Uh, this negative media, in turn, I want, to, um, I want to point out, will drive young people to migrate, and to migrate to the countries from which the funds are emanating, 
and create problems within the population of these countries that say, why are these people coming here? And it really gets to be a problem for the donor countries because they're saying, we're helping these countries. Well, are you really helping them? Why are they coming here? Okay. So that's another point. Uh, a third one is uh, um, international aid agencies own agenda is not necessarily in line with the country's needs or requests. Now, you see, I use the word international aid agencies because you have the donor countries and you have the beneficiaries, the beneficiary, uh, the countries that receive the funds. But in between, you have international aid agencies that will do the implementation. It's not the government of France or of Britain or of Holland or whoever that is coming and implementing the project and spending the money. It is these implementing agencies. And in the process, they develop their own needs. For example, the exorbitant fees they take, administrative fees. I've had some brushes with some of them. Uh, I've refused to pay a fee of 24% or I don't know, 30% on a project, which if you, if to put it in numbers, something that would cost 100,000, they will take 30,000. Would you accept that? This is money that's earmarked for the women of Afghanistan. Why is it going into your pocket? There was another agency uh, that had very creatively uh, combined three fees, and the total was 47%. So um, I did talk with some people in the OECD, and I said, you should really try and look into these fees business, maybe put some kind of regulation, some kind of cap. Um, uh, the, other, the other problem of international aid agencies is that they don't usually make local assessments before designing the program. And when you don't know what is on the ground, how can you be sitting in whatever capital uh, designing a project, how can you be really uh, doing justice to the needs of the people? Uh, one lo uh, very uh, recent thing was a, a aid agency was doing um, uh, something for nurses and uh, health workers. They were designing a program. They arrive in Afghanistan, and one of my advisors in my office is for health uh, issues. She goes and sits with them, and she tells them, well, do you know that uh, there is an association of nurses, and they had uh, done a research of what were their needs. Uh, were you able to include this in your design? Oh, no, we didn't know there was an association of nurses. So what kind of program you end up with? Something that's probably uh, very well-meaning, but not exactly what the country needs. Uh, and... Um, I want to uh, also address the decision to maintain routine humanitarian aid to internally displaced people. It's been now, I think, 14 or 15 years we help IDPs in Afghanistan, and the number keeps growing. The help is not resolving their issue. They're still living in camps in very dire conditions, and uh, we keep on putting the, uh, the money there so that those agencies keep existing. In some ways, they are very protective of their jobs. They don't have exit strategies. Uh, also, sometimes they um, serve the political goals of their respective countries. I think sometimes it's unsurmountable, but one needs to, s to mention it. And consciously or unconsciously, they sometimes end up being uh, manipulated by locals that know what are the um, trigger uh, expressions and will claim some something or the other to be able to get their hands on their funds. In conclusion, I want to say that change requires time, but actually I think it requires a new generation of actors. This is why I'm so pleased with the rising generation in Afghanistan on the local uh, level, but I think even internationally, 
there is a whole uh, group of um, how should you say um, aid workers, veterans of aid workers who have been there for years, 30 years, 40 years, who come with a mentality that needs to be changed and probably they are too old to change any mentality and maybe they should give way to young people instead. Thank you very much. Thank you, Madam Gani. Uh, now I would like to um, uh, introduce uh, our next uh, uh, speaker uh, that uh, is a, a champion on climate, uh, environment, uh, energy. It's the Princess Apse Jigma from Burkina Faso. Um, as a Mossi princess, you uh, are also very familiar with uh, the problems in, in the region, West uh, Africa and, and Sahel, uh, more gen generally. Uh, these regions face several um, uh, problems, uh, uh, some of them obviously related to the conflict uh, 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 and fragility, of others very much driven by, by strong uh, climatic uh, variation. Um, could you tell us about what you see as the main opportunities and challenges for women and, and, and young people in this, uh, this region? Thank you for uh, your excellency. My dear sister, you know, the first time I listened to her was at TV Saint Command. I just was like, I was go on the screen and hug. I say, yes, that's what I wanted to say. Thank you for m so much for uh, raising that. Good evening, good afternoon, everyone. Indeed, you said something with ending uh, your, your word, new generation of actors. I'm very happy to be part of this new uh, generation of actors. In the Sahel region, where I'm coming from, of course, we're facing a drought. And uh, I didn't, I'm not waiting. And my philosophy from uh, my grand grandma, Princess Yenenga, she didn't wait for anybody to come and help her to face her challenges and save her country. It was a woman, 12 centuries ago, a warrior, organizing an army of women to defend. She's my role model. I didn't look for a role model from outside, but I looked for a role model from my community. And I think that is important uh, to look the importance of what people are doing on the field, like me. I'm doing part of my homework to make life easier for those, for donation agencies, for instance, when they come down to help us. Then I can say, I already initiated things, what we call Initiative Moment for Sustainable Energy, for instance, a bottom-up uh, initiative who community-based, owned by women and youth, organized by themselves. I didn't go to them by saying, listen, I have a PhD in finance. I'm an electrical engineer in electricity, which is true, but I start by listening. It's important to listen to the community, then you can design things that suit them. That is what the initiative Mama Light it is. While I am uh, focused on um, renewable energy and climate issues, because those two are linked. We, are, we have already, even in Afghanistan, also in the other regions of this world, a uh, war of energy. Water is part of energy. Because you have drought, how technology, for instance, can help reducing, mitigating those wars. And also, how do we uh, create um, opportunities for our youth locally? That is the initiative, Mamalet, for sustainable energy. At Burkina Faso, for instance, that I know best and what I'm implementing with uh, the government came to me because they saw that I was already doing. As a part of the traditional authorities, it's my duty to find the solution for my community. I don't have any money, but my door is open. My mobile phone is open, and anyone can find it and reach me. This is how we are working. Listen to the people, propose the meanings, and the people can really do what, what, they, what they can. And you can come with policies, with the government and the agencies in, in the coherence with the international ongoing processes, what they call the go development goals. What does it mean 
for our local communities. What does it mean, Paris Agreement? How are we narrowing the, uh, this down to our people? And what will be the, the chair of the benefit on that one? Because you have billions that's flowing, how are we going to get piece of that? Just a concrete example, what we were talking about, the, uh, the, develop, the, uh, the Millennium Goals. You have a mechanism Africa just managed to cadre 2.7% of that money. But Paris Agreement coming again with another uh, criteria, how are we going to type in this? When you ask to my grandmother, before coming here, discuss with my mom. How do you see uh, what is climate, uh, climate change means for you? What is OEDD? Uh, um, uh, the the ODD uh, the SDGs means for you what it is and when I told her that when you change your behavior regarding you the use of energy regarding how we using our land is part of that what are the international community can help accelerating the local will the local initiatives. This morning, we're talking about the informal sector. I initiated the Global Expertise Hub for the informal sector. I didn't wait, wait, why? Because I know that our economies in Africa, my country, for instance, 46% of our GDP is coming from the informal sector. Informal sector doesn't mean that they are illegal or they are drug dealers. But unfortunately, in some definition at the World Bank or the IMF, Rather you, you, you're selling drugs or you're selling your uh, little potatoes or mangoes on the street, it's the same definition. I cannot let it be. But we need also to change the vocabulary, as you were saying. Another point, access to finance. This morning we raised that. How do we make, how do we adapt the financial tools? The women are the first paying back when they make loans. Then for me, it means that basically they're triple A, but they don't benefit on the rate of triple A. But this needs to change as well. Any big company can have benefit with paying up to 100% of rate. As a private sector, when you manage to have 12% of rate, to borrow money, that's a, that is, is already good. How can I compete myself, for instance, in the solar industry with my private company, Absi Solar? Local rules put me aside. I need to have a turnover of five million, have an asset, I'm sorry, by the time that I was contributing to GDP means that you need to make babies. By that time, you don't, you don't uh, uh, raising your assets. But I have a awesome husband who can help me to do that. The he for she is we, we're already implementing it. This also is the issue. If we want women, it's not, we need to walk the talk when we say we need to have more women and business. How do you bring women and business if you don't change the rules within the, uh, the bank systems? And also big corporates, they have the bank license. This means that they can go to central bank, has a bank, has a local bank, and borrow money. Sometimes at zero percent, it depends where they are located, and maximum one percent. I can't compete. Let's be honest. Then even um, if I don't apply to international call proposal, my, um, contribu my contribution as a policy here is, as I say at the high level political forum, in 2016 at the UN, as 30% of code proposals should go to local private sector. This is very important. You bring, you need to have criteria where you have women, the youth, the girls, that they have their part. If we do that, you will see that the, the sky will be the limit and there will really be the game changers because they're already doing it. And the Initiative Marmalade for Sustainable Energy, we are already doing that and we're using the blockchain technology because 
Maybe some of you know about that. That's what we are doing. We're raising money with it, and we're inviting the developing agencies like you. I was happy with our bilateral. I know we will come you on board. With this, there is no corruption because the blockchain will check rather the money goes with the rate upfront that we agreed. And that also the goods will be delivered, that education will be delivered. We have the new technology. We're talking about the uh, vocational training. We are already doing it and you, it's able to check it. The quality of education. We have new technology. You can be here and teach the good education to the youth and the countryside. Let's use the new the technology because they are at our service. And don't wait for people to help you because you are the solution. I'll stop there and I'm happy to be here. Uh, many thanks again for uh, inviting me in that program and I'm so happy to hear you. Thank you, Your Excellency. Thank, Thank you very much. <laughs> now I'd like to give the, the floor to uh, Karim Jantin, uh, Director General of SID and former Minister on International Development. Uh, today we have learned um, uh, based on our work on data and data collection that uh, Sweden is uh, uh, the country that is mainstreaming uh, gender uh, within development cooperation in the more uh, uh, eloquent manner. You have 88% of your uh, aid targeting gender equality and uh, women empowerment. Uh, you are also uh, implementing a feminist foreign policy um, you have identified women's rights and participation as a priority in fragile contexts. Can you tell us uh, how you will go about working on these um, issues? I will make a good try, but first, uh, because it's a huge topic, we're having a three-day seminar on this, a three-day conference rather in, in some weeks to come in Stockholm on, on uh, uh, gender, feminist, foreign policy, and how to, to work on, on uh, promoting a better life for everyone on this globe, but with putting the gender glasses on. I'll get back to, to what that would mean for us. But first of all, thank you for organizing this day. Uh, and thank you, it's been so interesting to listen to you, Your Excellency, and you, uh, and um, to learn more about your challenges in, in the countries. Um, some few words on Sweden and Swedish foreign policy, but mostly on Swedish development cooperation and the role of CEDA. Uh, some years ago, the current government in Sweden decided to put in place the first, uh, for any government ever, feminist foreign policy. I think that from the beginning, many laughed at it, actually, to be honest. Uh, because they said, what would that mean? It's, some, it's an add-on. It's something that will not mean anything. It has led to some very concrete things in Sweden for Swedish development cooperation, for Swedish foreign policy, but for also, also for other parts of our foreign relations, let's put it that, put it that way. But we are no longer the, the only country, but there are also other countries following suit. And that is a proof, uh, for me anyway, that it makes a difference. And it makes a difference in two ways. The one way is, of course, for the, the, the politicians, the foreign office and others uh, to make nice speeches and talk about the rights of women and men to have equal say in all senses, in all parts of societies. Being it a, a society in conflict or just out of conflict, or a, co a society not in conflict. But the equal right of men, women, boys and girls to have a say over their own lives. That's one thing. The other thing is that it's a very concrete tool. Uh, for us at CEDA, it means that we have supported, uh, to great extent actually, women's organizations, women, uh, the education of girls, uh, the lifelong learning for, for women to have the ability to go back to work, uh, to have the economic empowerment, to ha and, and in that sense having the right to decide on their own lives in different ways. Uh, for us, it's a very concrete tool. One example is, uh, which has been going on for a while though, uh, that is uh, our work, uh, the su CEDA support and our cooperation with our foreign office in Colombia. Sweden has supported the peace process in Colombia for many years. The role of CEDA and Swedish development cooperation has been to very concretely support women's organizations to make it possible for them to be part as peace negotiators in the peace talks. 
on their account system, they are setting their, they are of course deciding on their own agendas. But what we are contributing with is to give the possibility for women from Colombia to go to meet negotiators in other peace uh, or, or war or conflict situations. Uh, to go and, and learn more about how to negotiate and how to work in these kinds of situations and to be some, some kind of supporter in, in the process. So it's, it's for us, it's a very concrete to tool to even more increase our gender mainstreaming work uh, when we work in, in conflict and post-conflict countries. See that we're, uh, yeah, we're a big development agency, of course, and gender issues are one of our core issues. 88%, as was pointed out before, of our contributions are gen either gender mainstream streamed or have gender issues as their prime target. This means that we support both women and girls and men and boys in different ways. As it's for us, it's, an, it's a matter of human rights. Gender issues is a, it's a matter of human rights, being it in a conflict country or other countries. In, countries like in, in a country like Tanzania, a big chunk of, our d of what we support is education for all. Uh, education for boys, for girls, but also lifelong learning. But what we also do is that we support m uh, boys' organizations who try to work on their roles and to strengthen themselves in societies to take on a role that they want as Tanzanian young men. Uh, and that is an important part for us to, to support women's organizations, girls' organizations, but also support men and boys in different ways. So for us, it's a, it's a question as, as Sida. The feminist foreign policy makes a very, gives us a very concrete tool in both uh, working with policies, uh, human rights and rights issues as, as gender issues are, but also concrete tools in what kinds of uh, contributions and what kinds of, of things we should support to make uh, the, the possibility for, to strengthen rather the, the possibility of women and girls to have a say when there are peace negotiation, ne negotiations, when there are conflicts to be solved, and when there is power to be shared. Because gender issues is a matter of power sharing. That is our sort of starting point for gender discussion. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Our next speaker is uh, Gvinzi Muyu, Director for Gender at UN World Food uh, Program. Uh, this program, as we all know, uh, works in humanitarian crisis uh, context. Uh, how would you ensure that uh, your work um, helps advance gender equality uh, and supports women's uh, empowerment? Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for asking me. I would like to just make a statement which is very obvious, and that in start, WAT save, starts to save, our, to save all lives. So as you know, we are in H2 uh, countries, and also, as you know, there are so many crises which have sprung up everywhere around the world. So the, the beginning, uh, our big, our objective to start with is to save all lives. Now, when we start talking about gender, WAP in gender policy says WAP will adapt its food assistance to reach boys, listen to that, girls, men, and women. So that is where we are starting from. Uh, just uh, going back to the issue of language and terminology, which is very important, because we really need to discuss with our brothers and our sons and our husband to tell them that gender is not about women. It's about all of us, both men and women. We, uh, gender does not mean we are trying to take power from men, no. So we need to clear that because seriously, we will never achieve gender equality unless men play their part. So we can as well pack and leave it because which aeroplane is going to fly with one wing? Tell me. Huh? Are you going to take that plane? No. 
So we need to bring in men, our brothers and our husbands, to this fight. So now, I hear you asking, how do you know who they are going to assist? And that's where we come to the famous question of gender analysis and collection of data. This is a very big challenge for us, especially in humanitarian crisis. Because sometimes you can't just get in and say, we know where people are. And in the beginning, we may need to make estimates, working with partners, and then tighten these estimates as we go in. But it is so important to have proper gender analysis and collection of data. That is really key. OK. The, the other thing is the new, what we are calling the new way of working. Yeah. All of us now, it's not uh, now, we are not saying, has WFP will come and, and do the business and so on. No, the new way of working, we need to work with the local NGOs and, and national NGOs, civil society and the government to really have a good on outcome for everybody. For example, WFP works with a thousand NGOs, and currently 20% of our resources are going through local and uh, national NGOs. Partnership is very important. And partnership becomes even important when we come and say, we need to do A, B, F up to that. If we just do A and B is not attended for, problem is not solved. And this leads to a lot of crisis if people have to leave one area to go and look for complementary services. So us as partners, we really need to be linked up. That is very important. Now, when I, I come to women empowerment, very quickly, let me just give you uh, three examples. Um, I just want also to, to use my, uh, my example. At one point, I'm a woman from sub-Saharan Africa. I come from Kenya. I came from a village. The reason I'm here with you is because of going to school. So actually, education is very close to my heart because today I can support my children and to, to some extent the community. So this, this I'm talking from my heart now when I talk about education. So how do we, uh, I know there's a lot of discussion whether we are empowering people, do we really empower people, or create conditions for them to empower themselves. Okay, let's, let me talk about South Sudan. South Sudan, World Food Program, through the a project we call Purchasing for Progress, buys what we call women crops. Do you know what are women crops? Shall I just leave that with you to think what is a woman crop? For an easy answer is a woman crop is a crop which is not sold for income, it's just eaten by the family, so women don't have uh, income because it's a woman crop. So what WFP has said is we'll give you seed, to continue uh, uh, cultivating your women crops. And further, we will buy your women crops from you to feed schools, so putting money in the pockets of women. And an example is Anastasia. With this money, she's able to buy supplies for her children, send her children to school, buy better seats. Now, what is that? Isn't that, have we not created uh, an economic environment for Anastasia to empower herself? But the other thing which is uh, very also dear to me in South Sudan, when there was, uh, there was crisis and there was no food, grandmothers were encouraging girls to go to school. So because at school, they'll get school meals, and then they'll, 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 they'll say that that's a way of getting nutrition. And World Food Program buys from women farmers to feed schools. So this is a good link up. And then, and then my favorite, I have so many favorites, right? Okay. My favorite is where, and the reason I'm telling you this story is because I don't want you to lose hope. Currently in Lebanon, WFP is assisting young women from uh, Syria and teenagers to learn computer skills. Yeah, just, and uh, they are giving them cash or food assistance and their parents also for these kids to learn computer skills. Once they learn these computer skills, then they link them with private sector and they can get little jobs to do, to do online. Now, what is that? Isn't that something to talk about? Yeah? And what I'm saying this is when we see this situation, we must not just walk away and think it's hopeless. All of us can do something. And I leave you with that challenge. 
to do something and learn something about women crops. Thank you. Thank you very much. Our last speaker is Noella uh, Mohamiriza. Um, you have been involved in peace building programs since a uh, very early uh, age. Uh, you have been appointed as a girl ambassador for peace by the Global Network uh, of Women Peace Builders. Could you tell us how you think the participation of uh, women and girls in peace processes uh, and state building efforts can change outcomes? This is one of the main findings of our reports. We documented this uh, 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 perception, uh, but I'm sure that you can share some specific uh, examples from uh, DRC. Thank you so much, and uh, thank you for having me as a young person. I love the idea that we are called the future, but when we are not involved in the decision making, then I don't know who you are designing the future for. <laughs> so thank you so much, and uh, that question is very, I love the question because in the, in in DRC, the majority um, are actually women. So if, if we are actually going to resolve conflict and uh, bringing peace, then we have to involve the majority. Um, so I, first of all, um, it's very, it can be very tricky when it comes to countries like DRC in which I come from, because our family tend to be above the law uh, for example, I just recently, there was uh, this 16 years old uh, who got stabbed by her uncle three times in her heart, her heart and she died. And uh, things that, like that are not spoken about because they assume that family is going to resolve that matter, that issue. It's not, it doesn't go out. So it can be very hard when we have um, policies that come from the Western countries or organization to actually really reach the deep root of the issues because they don't speak the language, not necessarily the language, but they don't know how to communicate with the locals because they don't understand them. So I believe that women, because we are the ones who face those issues and we are the majority, I believe that we have a higher and a bigger role to play. Um, so, um, what I was suggesting was uh, empowering women through education. I love, um, I grew up seeing so many programs and I'm part of Girl Ambassadors, which, are, which is amazing because we get to, walk, uh, to work with local people and we get to speak on behalf of our own people. So it, it's more powerful than hearing somebody from, from another organization or from a Western country to uh, coming and sharing what they, they, uh, they think about the issue. It's easier when a local actually speaks because they, it's more real, re reliable and uh, it's easy to relate to what's happening in the, the community. So my suggestion really as a young, uh, a young person is uh, to implement things like um, gender equality in schools. Uh, we, have so many, um, we have so many conferences and forum about uh, gender equality throughout my country or even in Africa, but um, it's, it's funny because, not even funny, it's very interesting because you learn that in a forum or a conference, but once you come back home, you have brothers who look down on you, you have a husband who doesn't really respect you, he thinks that doesn't concern him, it's an option. So I believe we should actually implement uh, gender equality in studies starting in elementary school. Then men and women won't have an option, but all to learn the power or the importance of respecting each other. And um, um, I know there are already so many programs that are actually target that issue, but if it's not in school, then men feel like they don't have to attend. They don't feel like they have a, res a responsibility over there. So I think it's very important that we implement that in studies. So I don't know how that can work, because we have to, to work with the government to talk about um, how to actually implement that, the studies. I know they modified the CV of um, schools. I remember when I was, um, I think I was in, in elementary school, we started learning about sexuality. It was really new, but the government thought it was very important that we learn about us. And uh, it was very successful because people are aware, they know, and kids bring that at home, they discuss that, and they watch what their fathers or mothers are, the way they treat each other. So I think it's very important that we actually implement that. It's not even, to me, it's not optional. If I had the choice, I would actually implement that because then men learn that it's, it's not an option to attend a conference based uh, 
a conference talking about women in quality, it's, it's actually a, a class that they have to take. And uh, another thing is everybody is really busy uh, empowering women, but nobody's preparing men about those women. So we have women who are empowered, but they go back home and men have no idea. All they think about is like that, that woman is a threat, you know? Because our society is based on like the man is the, 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 you know, the leader of the household and everything. So when a woman is empowered to them, it's, it's, it communicates that that woman is trying to take the power from me. So I, I don't know how people think that men are empowered, especially after, especially coming from a country like the Congo where we have had wars for many um, years. Men are, are very vulnerable as well because I think they, people might confuse power with uh, being aggressive. So if we are empowering women, we should actually think about where are they going back to and to who, what kind of men are, going, uh, are they going back to. So that's uh, one of my suggestions. And also I was thinking about long-term uh, funds because we have so many programs. It, we have new programs, new NGOs every year in, in, in the Congo but it's not very long-term and it's not very sustainable. People implement something and when it doesn't work, they move to the next thing. So I think th there should be funding to the local. People are already doing something. And uh, even women who are already working so much in the, the community, because those women become so vulnerable. Because no one else, they, men or, because the society is driven by men, power, they think that the kind of woman who's very empowered is a threat. and. It, 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 it put them in a very vulnerable place. Like me being here talking like that very vocal about issue, it, it can be, it can seem beautiful to the Western world, but when I go back to my community, I become very vulnerable because everybody's like, she's trying to be a man or she's trying to take our place or she's very vocal, she's too strong in a sense or too much. So I think it's very good that we found local organization by women who are trying to actually make a difference and, and celebrate them, celebrate the achievement um, of what they are doing. Yeah, thank you. Thank you very much. We have a very interesting presentations. They were so interesting that now we are <laughs> running out of time. We have 15 minutes to uh, interact with uh, the with, uh, with you, so I, I would like to, to ask you uh, to table questions rather than making statements. Tabling questions and directing the questions for our uh, panelists. I'm seeing here uh, Phyllis and two, um, two colleagues there. Um, good afternoon. I will talk in English because the panel mainly speak English. My name is Nancy Gomez. I'm a half Peruvian, half Chilean. So uh, we ha we're facing also conflict issues and I'm part of the co uh, we organize a, a conference in Nigeria, uh, sorry, in Niger, which is the um, part of Africa, and we are facing those problems. Uh, we, we, we did work a lot to have financing to finance this, this forum. And at the end of the day, all the panelists, all the speakers were men. And we say, oh, hang on, we've been looking for, for money and not a woman on board, not a woman on stage, it's impossible. So we started to, to search for women. So we're still looking for women to come to Niger and present innovation and tourism. So it's the question for you because you were saying innovation is key for women all over the planet. Innovation is independence and you, you, you were talking about blockchain, which is a strong word that maybe nobody heard about it, which is very important. I would like to know what do you mean by blockchain in your development as a woman committed to gender? Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we have Phyllis and then the gentleman over there, Nadri. Good afternoon and thank you for a wonderful panel. Uh, my name is Phyllis McGrab. I'm a professor at Georgetown University and work with uh, First Lady Ulagani on the U.S. Afghan Women's Council. Um, I, I do have a, I, we've talked a lot about girls, women, education. Um, and there's one thing looming in my mind, and that is literacy. Um, literacy seems to be one of those very potent issues in moving women into roles other than unpaid work and moving them into the workforce. And women are um, very vulnerable in this area. And I'm 
would love for a comment from any of you around how you see literacy in these fragile situations. Oui, bonjour, je vais parler en français. Euh, je voudrais replacer ma question sur la question de, du, du thème du débat, qui est la question des, des, des zones de conflit, le rôle de la femme dans les zones de conflit. Euh, en tout cas, depuis le début de l'humanité, si les hommes ont toujours fait la guerre, je crois que la femme a, aurait un rôle très important pour elle actuellement bâtir la paix. Elle a, et même plus que la paix, on a... On a plus que la paix, la chose encore plus importante sur la question de la paix, ça serait que la femme travaille sur les préventions des conflits, là où elle sent les choses bien avant que les conflits puissent arriver. Elle peut être une actrice très importante sur cette question-là. On a vu à Bamako, quand, au sommet d'Alger à Bamako, il y a eu un collectif de femmes, d'associations de femmes qui ont vu le gouvernement pour aller à Alger participer. Et le premier ministre du, du Mali me disait, bon, on les a envoyés, mais malheureusement, on a vu qu'il y avait un manque de compétences sur la question de la gestion des conflits. Donc, euh, sur cette question de la paix, la femme aurait un rôle capital à jouer. Maintenant, je voudrais raconter, bon, vous, vous voyez que dans les institutions internationales, que ce soit ONU Femmes, que ce soit toutes les institutions, la charte africaine, tout, le, la question du genre est toujours mise. Donc, ce n'est plus un problème juridique, vraiment. C'est un problème de comment l'appliquer sur le terrain. Et moi, je voudrais soulever ici une question qui me semble capitale et importante. C'est s'appuyer, parce que jusqu'à présent, la tradition a été un blocage sur des questions, euh, d'avancer sur la question du genre. Mais l'anecdote que je raconte, c'était au Mali, je soutenais des femmes sur un projet de carité, de, de transformation des produits de carité. Il était 10 heures de la nuit, et ce jour, c'était Saint-Valentin. J'appelle mon épouse qui est ici en France, pour lui souhaiter 25 Valentin, et de l'autre côté, je vois une femme malienne, à 10 h du soir, 22 h qui chantait de, de l'eau dans un puits de 20 mètres avec son, bobo, son bébé sur le dos. Je dis, mais 10 h du soir, je vais la voir. Je dis, mais madame, pourquoi tu fais ça au milieu de la nuit pour prendre de l'eau Elle me dit, je dois faire euh, pour la maison. Je dis, mais pourquoi tu ne fais pas le matin Il Le matin, j'étais à l'agriculture. Je dis, mais et l'après-midi Il me dit, j'étais à l'élevage. Donc, toute la journée, elle travaillait. Pendant la même période... Les hommes, ils faisaient une veillée de prière. Je suis allé voir le chef du village. Je lui ai dit, mais, mais est-ce que tu sais que deux personnes sont venues voir le prophète de l'islam, lui ont dit, euh, dit euh, l'un travaille toute la journée, l'autre prie toute la journée. Qui est plus valeureux Le prophète de l'islam, l'a dit, bien sûr, celui qui travaille. Donc la question, c'est utiliser des vecteurs traditionnels pour faire comprendre dans nos, dans nos traditions que le travail et l'action de la femme est prime. La preuve, je termine, la preuve, c'est que j'ai dit au chef du village, cette femme, elle travaille du matin au soir, mais elle n'a même pas un hectare au titre foncier de ce terrain-là, alors qu'elle le mériterait plus que vous. Merci beaucoup. Another. So we have, we have two final questions, I'm sorry. Uh. Hi. <laughs> uh, my question is based off what Noella said, but is for the whole panel. Uh, so I was very amused and also very taken by, um, by your observation that we need to prepare men uh, to kind of encounter these more empowered women. And I feel like that's really, that's really true and something that maybe is overlooked. But then for the whole panel, uh, I was just wondering what concrete suggestions might you have for us to actually go about doing that, both on, say, in, in like a systemic and uh, institutional level uh, you know, from leadership, but also for, you know, individual empowered young women, how can they go about, you know, combating the pushback that they will sometimes experience as they try and, you know, uh, come into their own and, uh, you know, they try and you know, demonstrate their own power. Thank you. Thank you. And I think that we have one final question. I'm very sorry for, for all the other um, members, but we have to conclude here. Yes, in the center, please. Hi, my name is Corazona. Um, I work at the OECD, and I have a similar question to the Peruvian-Chilean colleague. Um, I would like to know more about um, the implementation of blockchain technology in Burkina Faso and um, how this is possible to be implemented in the larger Sahel region, given the fact that you know there is also um, infrastructural obstacles to it. So I'd be very interested in that. Thank you very much. Thank you, and we will go directly for our uh, panelists for a final for a final run. By we have uh, seven minutes, so I would like to have 
one minute each. It's very challenging, but um, I, 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 I would like to ensure that the next panel is not being delayed. It was really very interesting panel. Lots of uh, good suggestion, good examples. Um, my recommendations very quickly, uh, careful use of vocabulary, um, recognizing the immense role women already play, even in the most traditional societies. They are the ones that keep the family together. When, if, when a woman disappears, either through death or through other things, other reasons, the family falls apart. So let's start by saying that women are already playing a very big role. Um, uh, also, uh, think of women as partners, not as victims. Uh, I was at a, uh, very quickly, uh, on the 8th of March, instead of doing a series of speeches, we had a town hall. and But we had a presentation on domestic violence. and. Uh, one very young woman, which I didn't know, just stood up and said, could we please stop talking about domestic violence? We all know that it exists. Can we talk about positive things, please? So it's really uh, the young people uh, uh, are more comfortable saying, okay, there is domestic violence, it exists everywhere, but it's not the thing that defines women. Um, and uh, uh, how to provide women with tools for becoming powerful. So definitely professional training, giving them access to professional training in uh, by building institution. This is directed to uh, donors. Build institution in country. It's preferable than taking people to train uh, uh, abroad. And provide on the job mentoring programs. And um, if you're thinking in terms of building sustainable institution, Somebody mentioned NGOs just a couple of minutes ago. Uh, I think you should avoid working through NGOs because it's a very unsustainable model. Every six months, every one year, they have to go with their begging bowl, finding more funds. It's the most unsustainable model. Uh, NGOs should turn into civil society institutions, sustainable institutions. Uh, regarding international aid agencies, I just want to say that uh, the uh, report uh, that uh, Mr. De Silva was mentioning has some uh, proposals that I am uh, totally uh, agreeing with. Uh, uh, and uh, But the only thing I doubt a little bit is the connection between, um, a, a um, causal connection between uh, gender equality, as you say, and uh, peace and um, reestablishment of peace in post-conflict country. I think both of them are important, but I don't think that one is the cause of the other. Thank you. Thank you. Do I have the time to reply to the question that I have one been minute. raised? One minute. Okay, I think uh, block technology, of course, I'm a businesswoman, I'm doing business. So it means that I invest money to do this, that you can understand that I don't give it for free. You want to know, you come with me, we make a deal and we make it happen. And then we pay taxes <laughs> back, <laughs> simple as that. So uh, re of course, gender balance in your panel, but as I will see my uh, general manager is here, Dr. Anton Martins. So you can see with him what is possible that uh, to join if uh, my schedule allows it. Of course, the topic is interesting. I will make myself available for that. Uh, regarding uh, the conclusion is, I will, she said it all. Uh, I think no more NGOs. You know, why we have OECD countries, you don't have NGOs everywhere. So it's time also to, uh, to, st to change uh, has the government cannot always, uh, cannot hire our youth, we need to go private sector. And that's where the blockchain technology is interesting because we are going private and it's important to pay taxes. And I can ensure you with what our system, the government get his tax within the split of second. Whatever we do, this is transparency. And, it, the, and we quit all the layers 
If you want us to, to implement your program, we're doing it with little, we're doing a lot. That is the principle. And uh, I will insist again, in terms of policy, it's important to allocate coal proposal, where it is developing ODA money to the youth and the women. If you don't make the money available, it's no excuse anymore, no time to complain. Technology is there. We need to make use of it. And implementation, implementation, and stop talking. Thank you for your kind attention. Thank you. Um, I'll try to be brief. I'll say three things. One thing on Swedish uh, feminist foreign policy, which is very concrete, and two important things that I think that all women and men should think about when getting women into to the center of, of all stages. Uh, the one thing is that one important part of Swedish feminist foreign policy was to appoint a board of female negotiators, peace negotiators, women that could lead by example and find new women uh, that could be part of negotiating teams in different conflicts. I think it's important to find those women. They are there in all countries everywhere around the world. That is the first thing. The other two things is, uh, I think that t you asked uh, <laughs> for for, an, uh, for a, a tip or an advice or whatever on, on how to support women. Uh, I would say two things. I'm a mother of a 21-year-old boy. My responsibility is to, to develop him <laughs> into a mature young man. Uh, and I think that the role of mothers uh, to, to encourage men and women, boys and girls, to be uh, mature human beings is important. Th that is the one. The other thing is we must support each other. Girls must see girls and appoint girls. Uh, women must see that girls uh, give place for young women to have the place at negotiating tables in political scenes uh, or elsewhere. We have to, to uh, encourage and employ, appoint young women, young girls and, and women to actually and lead them into the tables where the decisions are made. And by saying that, I would like to encourage all women to, re to engage in politics. There are governments everywhere. They all look different, they all systems are different, but they are there. And the laws are decided by parliaments, and there must be women enough in parliaments to make good decisions. That is my final point. Thank you. Uh, okay, uh, uh, quickly, let me touch the idea of uh, maybe unfriendly men or men who feel that women have taken away things from them. And for me, I really keep insisting, we must bring men into the discussion. If I look around this room, are we talking to like-minded? Are we talking to people who have got uh, challenges? We really need to bring men in the discussion. One of the things which we have found has reduced violence in Ninja, where we have uh, working with FAO and Eva and UN women, we have what we call Dimitri clubs, where the community mean, meet both men and women. And they have discussion about what is happening in the community, and they come to an agreement which benefits both men and women. The other thing which we found works is when a man understands what does it mean for his wife to be doing uh, 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 um, an, an activity which is generating income. What does it mean? And in the basic level, it means his children are going to have better food, they are going to go to school, and which man does not want that? So men needs to be really explained how it is and benefit for the whole family. I really want to keep the challenge on your, on your hands, that is to bring more men to the discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Noella? So I'll just answer two questions real quick. The first one was asked by a beautiful lady, but I don't remember her name, but um, I think it's really inviting men to the table. Uh, if you're in college, if you're out of college, it's, it's if you have um, places where you have discussion, I think it's really trying to make them understand. We assume that they're empowered, but they're not. Some of them are just scared men. So um, it's really wanting to hear what they have to say about it. So doing discussions at school, that would be important. In my opinion, for, for um, DRC, 
for example, or other African countries, it's starting to prepare the next generation. That's why I actually suggested that we implement uh, a course in school so that we won't have to deal with the next generation, how to inform or how to train them. So it, it would be there, it would be just very <coughs> normal to have a course that explains um, the empowerment and it's very important that we use the, the real, the, the it's really important that we, we look into terminology, what, how we use it, because sometimes it, some people, especially back home, because I understand my people, they assume that it's something from the Western that they are, tr they are trying to impose on their family values and things like that. So, but if we can go with locals, or especially with young people who understand uh, both perspective, the Western and um, the African perspective, it's really easy to actually make them understand, if that makes sense. Um, and for a gentleman who was uh, talking about um, the village matters with the uh, tradition, the conflicts between them. So uh, as I said in my presentation, I think sometimes uh, in African countries, family is more powerful than law. So if you went to that, uh, the head of the village, if you actually involve him, how to actually have discussion with, with men and, and, and their wives, how to help one another, I think that can work. But if you try to implement it by yourself, it won't probably work. It's sad to say that, but if you involve the, the head of the village, they are more respected, and that would actually make a huge difference. Thank you. Thank you. And there was one, one question miss, uh, missing, so. Thank you. Je voulais pas laisser quand même mon frère du Mali uh, uh, sans la réponse. Donc, venant de, faisant partie de la, um, de l'autorité uh, traditionnelle au, au royaume Mossi, Sa Majesté uh, le Moro Naba a été le parrain de euh, la journée internationale de la femme au Burkina. Vous voyez donc, euh, je suis une des, des premières princesses à, être, à faire partie du comité euh, des chefs euh, pour les décisions. Donc pour, pour vous démontrer aussi qu'au niveau traditionnel, il y a des choses qui se font et sa majesté a été extrêmement claire là-dessus. Donc je pense que, euh, et, et j'ai aussi euh, lancé cette idée pour que nous reprenions cette coalition ancestrale qui existait pour que justement au niveau du Burkina Faso, le système royal discute aussi avec le Il y a un système royal au niveau africain où que moi j'aille au, au niveau africain, dans quel que soit le pays, étant Altesse royale, je suis reçue parce que nous nous devons allégeance et nous nous respectons. Et je pense que ce côté traditionnel, et je garde ma position de, de femme, donc, c'est-à-dire qu'il euh, y a des valeurs par-dessus lesquelles je ne vais pas. Et ça ne veut pas dire qu'en respectant certaines traditions, si quelqu'un de l'extérieur, une ONG, vient voir, va dire, mais qu'est-ce qu'elle fait, la princesse, à enlever ses chaussures, à se courber comme ça Non, ça ne veut pas dire que... Et on me dit, ben, Altesse, levez-vous, parce que j'ai respecté la législation. Et on me reconnaît, on me remercie pour ça. Et à ce moment-là, on peut accompagner... Et, 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 le, et, et, et rendre ça vraiment très fort. Je pense que c'est ce côté que notre sœur de l'Afghanistan a très, très bien expliqué. Et la maman dans l'éducation, moi, je peux vous dire que mon frère, même si sa femme ne cuisine pas, il peut cuisiner correctement, il va au marché. Ma mère lui dit, je veux faire telle cuisine. Abdou, tu vas. Il, il va faire le, le marché. Donc, c'est l'égalité entre les gens. C'est la maman. The mother is the center of education. As she said, she has a, a boy, but she educating him in the way that with he, when he will come in society, he will behave in the way it should be. We, the mother, are the key for gender equality. That's it. Thank you so much, your moderator, Thank for you. allowing this. Well, and, 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 and also the father. I'm a, I'm a, I'm a father of a, a boy and two girls, and, and I'm... And I'm delighted that not only the, the, the girls, but also the boy were grown in this idea of the human right um, um, and, and uh, how education is really vital to foster a behavioral uh, change. And uh, I'm thrilled with the, with the, with the messages that we um, uh, have discussed uh, this afternoon. Um, I don't have the, the, the ambition of summing up uh, synthesizing every, everything that was said, but I would say that there are three messages that from our perspective from OECD uh, is vital. First, we need um, uh, policy, financing, uh, but also a dialogue, and I'm glad that in this uh, uh, global forum, 
uh, co-organized by uh, Development Cooperation Directorate and by the Development Center, I'd like to thank the team. We were able to get the private sector, the civil society, the government, uh, international organization, local authorities in a dialogue that uh, requires policy, reforms, financing, but also uh, a mind shift. Second, uh, we need this debate to be informed by evidence. And you can count on us. Uh, we uh, are eager to get more data, more evidence, and to have a, a dialogue that is based on this robust uh, uh, evidence. That's why we think that we need to address uh, underlying social norms and uh, gender relations in fragile situations by engaging more strategically with men. Second, we need to partner uh, more with uh, national governments, uh, local authorities, uh, with local women's organizations. This will increase the quality of programs and help support uh, locally led change. And finally, we need to join up policy frameworks on gender equality, conflict, and uh, fragility uh, quite often instead of the good trends on financing. Donors' policies and guidelines on conflict and fragility are often disconnected from those on uh, gender equality and uh, women uh, empowerment. That's why we want to learn more, to work more uh, within the gender net, but also within uh, INCAF and uh, producing uh, more uh, um, uh, evidence. And soon we will prepare an operational guidance on how uh, donors can address these issues in practice. I think that um, it was a very interesting session, so I, I'm, I, I'm sure that you would like to give a round of applause for our uh, panelists. like to encourage everyone to stay for our final session uh, and also to be reminded that this final session will be conducted with questions through Slido and Twitter. So it will take a moment for us to transition and they will have a, a photograph here but please take a look at the back of your booklet once again. I feel like the, the teacher in the room. Please remember how to use the Twitter and Slido systems so that we can engage together in the conversation. Wait one second. And now we're reaching the very end of uh, the uh, 2018 edition of the OECD Global Forum on Development. Uh, we're particularly delighted to welcome on stage uh, those who are going to uh, bring together all the takeaways, the lessons from our day of discussion. I call on Claire Woodcroft, Executive Director of Woodcroft Associates and former CEO of Emirates Foundation to come on stage. She will be the moderator of that session. Uh, so kindly note, as Lisa said, that uh, questions will be taken on Twitter and Slido. Please let me welcome also on stage Mr. Masamichi Komo, Deputy Director General of uh, the OECD, back on stage. Ahmed Bader, social entrepreneur and the founder of uh, Naratio in Iraq, and Mrs. Hayer Sharif, which you may remember from the opening session, who's our youth ambassador and founder of Cordaid, and together we build it from Libya. Thank you very much, and without uh, further ado, I think we should um, move into our next session. Then? You're missing one Thank you. Man. Thank you. No, that's not. Yeah, okay. Claire, fire away. Testing. Thank you, Henri Bernard. Uh, thank you, ladies and gentlemen. Please, can you take your seats? We're going to kick off the final concluding session with uh, three wonderful panelists, so I do hope you'll all stay to hear our summary of the last day, day and a half, and that you will take this opportunity to engage with us interactively. As was just announced, we are going to be asking you to send your questions via Twitter, 
or Slido. I don't actually know what that is, but apparently it's, uh, it's an online site where you can go and log on and find this event. So please have a look at that now. We want your questions, but we want to do it efficiently, and we want to make sure that this debate is as digital as possible. So let's start then by looking at our uh, mission today is uh, the unenviable task that the OECD gave me actually and my fellow panelists of summarizing what I think has been a uh, very rich uh, and detailed discussions including the discussions we had yesterday on the youth program. So clearly doing that in 60 minutes is going to be a challenge, so I'm going to rely on our friends at the OECD and all the rapporteurs that they have to, to capture the broader essence of the discussions and no doubt do it uh, more scientifically than we can. But the four of us are going to share with you our thoughts on what we've been hearing in the last day uh, and indeed hopefully adding some elements of where we think there may have been some gaps in the conversation and indeed inviting you all to contribute as well with both your, your thoughts, your questions and, and your summaries. And, and notably what's missing. The OECD, as we've heard earlier, is, is a great global convening platform and it's a, it's a policy platform. So if there are really um, very significant areas that you think we haven't touched on in the last day and a half, then this is your opportunity to let us know. Um, before we do that, I just wanted to do a quick straw poll to see, uh, I know we're talking about women and youth, but I wanted to see how many young people we have in the room. So I would ask uh, those of you under the age of 30, can you please raise your hands? Excellent, quite a lot, probably even 50%. Uh, so all of you under the age of 30, raise your hand if you feel that you have an active and regular engagement with policy dialogue. Not as many, but uh, not bad. So that's really one of the elements that we're going to be looking at today, is the extent to which youth and women have a voice in policy dialogue, and the extent to which they can, uh, their needs uh, and their aspirations can be captured in, in this, uh, this platform that the OECD provides us, in partnership, of course, with other developmental actors. So we're going to look first at uh, the youth agenda. We had a detailed session yesterday and there is uh, an excellent report that is available outside, I think, on the work that has been done in nine countries looking at youth policy. Um, it was a bit sad to hear some of the old discourse around academia and uh, skills mismatch. I think this has been a conversation that's been going on for too long. We need to look more closely at how can we trigger really a revolution in the education sector. We know that the output of formal academic institutions is not necessarily meeting the needs of the labor market. We know that young people are being told they need to reskill every two years. Young people are somewhat depressingly being told that they don't have the right skills for jobs, that they will no longer have a job for life. Uh, and increasingly we are realizing that uh, vocational skills are uh, very much uh, as important as formal education. But this creates quite a difficult construct for any young person trying to join the labor market. And notably when uh, those of us in older generations have some misperceptions around young people spending all their time frivolously uh, on, on social media. And I think we need to acknowledge that um, young people are digital natives. They live in a digital world. A digital world creates an exponential speed of change. We don't know what the jobs of tomorrow are, and we are not necessarily listening effectively enough to what youth want. Yesterday we talked about the importance of co-management of policies and about the importance of youth councils. But do we actually know what kind of jobs young people want? We may think they're spending hours fruitlessly on social media, and they may actually be triggering a whole new level of creativity and industry and productivity. So on that note, I want to hand over to our first panelist today, Ahmed. I'm not going to give a formal introduction to any of my panelists because you have their bios in the pack. Suffice it to say that Ahmed is a, a young person. Uh, and Ahmed has been doing some amazing inspirational work around creativity and engaging digitally. And I'd really like to hear from you, Ahmed, not only your thoughts on what you've been hearing throughout today, but the work that you're doing. Help us understand 
what kind of jobs do young people want and what should policy be doing to help you? Thank you, Claire. Yeah, I think um, you know, we had a very, very long day and, and it's been really incredible to hear um, about all of these issues from stakeholders of all kinds. And I think one thing that really stood out to me today was not only talking about these issues, but talking about how we frame this, uh, these issues. Uh, I work a lot in advocacy, and in advocacy, um, you know, sometimes it gets criticized for not being action-oriented. Um, but today, we kind of made that link between action and policy, and, and you know, it's gonna continue beyond uh, just yesterday and beyond just today. Uh, so I think this specifically something that was really important that was pointed out is that how do we um, go into a community, go into a, a country, try to uh, instill change, but not victimize, right? Um, in my own personal experience, I'm a refugee from Iraq, uh, came over to the U.S. Uh, in 2008, um, and you know at that time I was nine, just going on ten. Um, so you know that initial shift. Uh, forces you to adapt, and that's not this adaptation isn't really uh, uh, specific to the refugee experience, but it's specific to just the youth experience in general. Um, Claire talked earlier about how uh, you know a lot of young people spend most uh, a lot of their time uh, with uh, social media, and, and typically that's seen as oh they're just wasting their time on social media. Uh, when I first started to uh, realize the power of, of storytelling and media. I was in high school, I was a sophomore in high school, second year, and uh, I was in the uh, in having lunch, and, and the lunch table, I started realizing that by sharing my experience of being Iraqi, from being a refugee, from um, being Muslim, things were changing, people's minds were shifting. Um, and then I started an organization called Narratio that publishes poetry and art and photography and stories of youth, uh, refugee, youth uh, refugee youth and otherwise, from uh, over 13 countries. And once I started to do this, uh, people uh, during interviews or during talks, they would come up to me and say, do you have time to be a teenager? You know, what, do, you, do you still do teenage things? Do you still watch Netflix and go on social media? Um, but in approaching that question, the assumption is that what I'm doing isn't what teenagers are supposed to be doing, right? And that's something that I think needs to change and that you know, young people all over the world are taking matters into their own hands. Um, you asked earlier about access um, and being in these spaces and being able to share our experiences. Um, you know, young people are waiting. Um, young people are, uh, they're waiting, but they're not idle. I think that's really important to note. Um, you know, we're gonna make change regardless if we get access to spaces here and there. Um, the tide is already turning. Um, you know, whether it's cryptocurrency um, or other technologies that kind of are, are taking over and this kind of democratiza democratization of entrepreneurship that's taking place. Um, so again, today has been a really, really incredible step in the right direction in, in realizing the power of youth, uh, the power of uh, empowering women. And, and, and again, I, I just think it's so, so important to uh, note that youth are already in the conversation, they're already um, inciting and, and, and creating the r their own change, and that organizations such as the OECD um, should kind of look to be partners um, in nurturing um, this type of progress and, and taking down the barriers um, that youth uh, may face. Well, you heard it there first, uh, folks, so that if young people are not formally engaged in the policy dialogue, then they are going to create the policy. And I think it's a very valid point. We, we've seen it, and we talked earlier about, um, you see it in the US where young Americans who are not even able to vote are t taking the NRA policy uh, challenge to hand. You see it with youth in the UK talking about Brexit. Uh, I think it uh, resonates absolutely that you have the tools. And of course, being in a digital space, you can connect with millions of people very quickly. So thank you for sharing that with us. I want to come back a little bit to the issue of the skills mismatch and then move into women. So we heard also yesterday a lot and even today about the fact that even though levels of educational enrollment are going up, particularly for women, still we have a shortage of talent and, and a skills mismatch. And I want to um, ask 
you and Hajar about that, and we can uh, touch on it uh, later as well. But, but this issue, of, so why is it that if we're getting more education for young people, we're still not getting the right skills? Is it that how we deliver the educational model is flawed? How do you learn as young people? Is a, is a school going to be an obsolete construct in the future? Is a digital learning the way we learn? Um, let's ponder that for now and also link it to, therefore, skills and education for women. But, Haja, I wanted you to comment, if you would, on some of the discussions we've been having around the return on investment in women. Um, the last panel, we had some great comments on clearly the need to get men into the conversation. Uh, and I like the comment from one of the panelists that the, the family is more powerful than law, that how do we use community structures to empower women. But specifically, one of the things that stood out for me uh, over the course of the day was that we have been consistently saying for decades in the development space that there is a very significant return on investment in women. We know about sexual and reproductive health, that if you educate young girls, you can uh, drop down levels of uh, pregnancy. We know that if you fund women-headed businesses, they uh, not only create economic value, but often have enhanced financial returns, and yet we don't see too much numerical evidence of this. Are we making a strong enough case, Haja? We, we know in principle that investing in women is a good thing to do, but what's the business case for that? What's the financial, what's the economic case? Is that a space we can do more in? Yeah, I think when it comes to the matter of women's rights um, and women empowerment, I mean, we don't need less recognition. When it comes to the formal recognition, we do have that already. Um, we have CEDAW, we have, uh, for instance, when it comes to women participation in peace building, we have a, a whole United Nations Security Council Resolution 1325 that basically tackles that. So the formal recognition is there, but then the problem or what is lacking is how that is being done on ground. Um, now, even when we talk about the economic empowerment of women or how women participate into the economic building, for instance, I think at least, and again, I'm drawing from my own experience, but also what I'm seeing in the region, the broader context, there is also a sense of, let's say, romanticization um, when it comes to the role of women in peace building, um, for instance, um, people would say, well, women are natural peacekeepers. Women as mothers are, are soft, are natural, they will maintain peace, etc." cetera. Um, and I think that sense of romanti romanticization um, leads to the wrong direction because if we are building the interventions that basically women are peacekeepers, for instance, just because they are naturally soft or kind or whatsoever, I think then that will we'll take them apart from the solution. Because, for instance, if we're talking about an armed conflict, basically the problem or what we're seeing as an image, we're seeing men fighting, we're seeing men holding the weapons and fighting each other. So basically, if that is the problem, then what is the solution? The solution is very simple. We just need to convince these men to stop fighting. And then in return, we don't see women sitting in the negotiation table. So that element of romanticization, when, whether when it comes to women participation in peace building, but also when it comes to women participation in the economic development, it's often looked at at the soft scale, let's say so. So that's why even when it comes to finance and, and what sort of economic growth women can bring into the table or how they can actually contribute to the national economic growth, it's often again looked at from the soft aspect. Um, and then the soft aspect of things, basically women are not really contributing to the, to the formal economic growth, for instance. And this is something that has been discussed earlier as well, that the labor that women does, whether in the household, but also outside the household, it's not considered even as labor. So it's not even measured when it comes to the economic growth in itself. So it really connects to the point you made earlier about changing the, the lexicon around uh, development. You were talking about the language we use in development and how we talk about the third world, which is awful description. But, um, but it, it seems like even when it comes to the gender lens, as you say, there's this assumption that we should engage women because they're kind of nicer than men. When actually, there is a, and, and there's very little data to prove that. I think women can be as violent as men and if they are in the public sphere as, as men are in the main. Uh, it's around the value proposition. So what is the value of actually getting women economically empowered, engaged in the labor force, uh, and indeed engaged in businesses? That there's really hard metrics that we could be delivering around how female engagement is, is powerful and contributes to uh, development. 
let's uh, move from that point then to development itself. So, Masam, over to you now for the, you are <laughs> single-handedly representing now on this panel the development and donor community, no pressure. Uh, I know you're new at the OECD. <laughs> Um, but we would like to talk a little bit, uh, pick up on, uh, again, the points that Haja mentioned earlier around the development discourse. So we've had a lot of discussions today around how policy dialogue is important, but there's been quite a few challenges around implementation. So it's great that we have forums like this where, and we have a wonderful data from the OECD and we have rich reports uh, and a lot of insights from the donor community. But how do we make sure that we, um, as in the words of Elvis Presley, um, uh, a little less conversation and a little more action? How do we make sure that we translate that data and the excellent policy discussions that you have into real tangible action on the ground? And how do we measure it? I mean, we heard uh, the word impact on the opening panel, but I felt we didn't hear the word impact enough, actually. Uh, and coming from the philanthropic sector, we have been notoriously bad as foundations in not talking enough about impact and talking about inputs rather than outputs. But what more can the development community do to make sure that we are not just ivory towers of uh, academic theory around how to create, how to deliver on the SDGs and actually ensure that you are creating a policy environment that translates into real socioeconomic outcomes? Thank you very much. Well, it sounds like a, a billion dollar question, but um, um, one thing I can say perhaps, oh, of course, I, I should first thank you for having this debate. Thank you for the wonderful discussion today. And of course, thank you for everyone's presence here. This has been a fascinating um, day, uh, truly rich in uh, many ways. And I learned really a lot. And I'm still in learning mode in that sense because I'm relatively new here. But um, there is this um, maybe a few. Uh, there are a, a few points that uh, were identified today, in terms of this um, either a gap or disconnect between the good policy uh, guidances or good policies or good principles that have been developed, best practices being identified, but um, lacking proper implementation, a disconnect, maybe even a. Um, disenchantment uh, on the ground. Uh, and of course, um, I, I hate to use this word, but uh, there is a flourishing aid business that um, sort of is self-perpetuating. Um, and um, to address this, I, I think we have to go back to the basics. Um, and there, I think I, um, I can find uh, uh, places where the OECD can really contribute. One is, uh, as you mentioned, data. And um, data is not just numbers. It's, it's more um, uh, including, of course, the qualitative elements of uh, what is happening on the ground, the local context, the, uh, uh, the, the, the real problems that are um, um, hampering or preventing the, the good policies to be uh, um, having an impact. And this uh, can range from um, uh, uh, misaligned incentives, uh, uh, maybe uh, overly burdensome or even distortive regulation, um, uh, and not enough resources put into implementation. I mean, implementation requires resources, and uh, governments may not have been really uh, paying uh, enough attention to this aspect. So um, I think uh, by way of um, uh, having more dialogue, more uh, 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 better data, more um, uh, uh uh, identification of issues analysis um, at the OECD, we can help to somehow um, put more focus on implementation, but also uh, an informed debate on uh, what is the, the problem. And then, of course, we want to bring it to the ground. And there, of course, the OECD cannot do this alone. We would like to involve everyone. And so this involvement of um, stakeholders and involvement of uh, the, the use of, uh, of everyone, men and women, that is the part that uh, we need to put in more resources, more attention, and um, uh, somehow make it happen. Exactly. So more involvement of youth. Uh, one might argue that there is not enough um, 
digital activity in this space, that a lot of what happens at the OECD is producing excellent reports, but they're not necessarily getting distributed or disseminated using technology, using social media, getting infographics, engaging young people, having a conversation uh, via Twitter. That's perhaps something that the OECD can look into doing, uh, social media more broadly. But also you said more dialogue, which worries me a little bit, because it seems that there's actually quite a lot of dialogue happening. There are numerous developmental, international developmental committees having policy dialogue, and yet still we are with Denmark only having one third, I believe, of its bilateral aid dedicated to women and youth. So what can the OECD do specifically to encourage bilateral donors to, to massively increase that allocation? If we are saying that this is the most critical socioeconomic development challenge that we have, youth and women, four billion people, why can't the OECD and other donors, other international development uh, organizations, do more? Why can't we change that structurally from one third to 90%, 100%? Again, that is a critical point. And of course, um, I can argue that um, we need much more resources here. But on the other hand, um, um, what we can do better is uh, really to um, communicate. And um, I think. Um, um, this can also be uh, called not, not exactly a dialogue, but it's more um, a t town meeting um, because um, we've had a lot of dialogue, yes, and we've had so many meetings in basically behind closed doors. I mean, uh, with more transparency, of course, but um, uh, basically amongst um, either government officials or like-minded people. I think we go out, have to go out and reach out to to um, um, th the world. Um, and for that to happen, of course, um, we have to change the uh, mindset, we have to change the priorities, we need more resources. But even within uh, those constraints that we uh, already have today, um, we are actually doing some effort in um, uh, knowing more about um, what is happening on the ground, um, considering creating platforms um, uh, on a region by region basis to um, um, uh, engage with more stakeholders, a, mu a much broader um, uh, range of um, people. And um, of course, the new technologies. I mean, we have to uh, uh, leverage that. And let's turn the question to the uh, youth on the panel then. And notably, both of you come from the Arab world, uh, North Africa, where we know the vast majority of populations are youth. Uh, what are your specific recommendations? How do we ensure that the voice of women and youth gets captured in international centers like the OECD? What's some specific recommendations that you would have? Ahmed. Um, in my experience, the, the one of the purest forms of uh, empowerment, I guess, I, I know that word has been thrown around a lot today, uh, has been establishing uh, incubators um, for uh, entrepreneurs where they can develop their organizations, whatever that may be, um, and kind of create more opportunities for themselves and the communities they, c they come from. Uh, one thing that I've realized is so, so incredibly powerful, um, no matter the issue, no matter the community you're trying to affect change within, is having individuals from that community um, lead an organization that's addressing an issue that that community is struggling with. So if you're trying to address, um, uh, let's say, um, edu education and refugee camps, uh, why not have a refugee represent um, that organization, have them um, implement that change? Uh, so agency, it comes down to agency, um, and we can apply this to the general role of youth um, and, and, and creating change in, in that like you have to create some type of agency for individuals to realize that their work is valid and that their work counts for something. Uh, in my home country of Iraq, for example, um, 36 million people, um, 18 million, half of the country is under the age of 19. Um, when we went, I went home for the first time in almost a decade, uh, three years ago, uh, I sat down across from my cousin who was a year or two older than me. And uh, you know, whenever he asked me this question of, um, so what have, you, what have you been up to? What have you been doing? I, I, I felt uncomfortable in answering because I knew that he didn't have the same opportunities um, to do what he wanted to do and to fulfill his potential. Uh, so again, agency is so, so, so important, but um, more and more 
uh, opportunities uh, to create uh, something as simple as a website that gives other individuals an opportunity to share their story is accessible. Um, you know, anyone in this room can, you know, go online and buy a website and pay ten dollars a month, and the website can empower a thousand people. You know, that's an amazing thing that wasn't accessible. Um, you know, 30, 40 years ago. So the potential for, for impact has increased. You asked me earlier about jobs and what kind of jobs are, are youth looking for? Um, and, and the answer to that, and, and I hope it's, it's um, you know, not too expected, but it, there, there shouldn't be an answer to what specific job youth want because as we move forward, we're gonna see, uh, you mentioned the gig, uh, gig economy earlier, we're gonna see, um, this has been backed up by statistics, is that people are moving more and more away from traditional uh, jobs and, and more non-traditional um, aspects. Um, in the US, uh, there's more and more use of uh, 1099 forms with big cor corporations, and these forms are used um, for uh, freelancers um, who are trying to kind of, uh, who have to pay taxes on the income they're receiving. Um, so, you know, freelancing is kind of the way of the future, and. Uh, you know, yeah, uh, but we are moving in the right direction. It's a very valid point, and yesterday we talked about, so in the OECD's youth report that was launched yesterday, um, there was this point that, you know, often enterprise is pitched as the panacea for everything. You know, all young people are suddenly all going to become successful entrepreneurs, even though we know becoming an entrepreneur and successful one is, is very challenging, uh, notably if you don't have access to capital, to mentoring, uh, et cetera. Um, and yet, it seems that what you're saying is that young people do need entrepreneurial skills. So even if not every young person goes on to be an entrepreneur, having commercial acumen, business acumen, and financial acumen can help you such that even if you don't set up your own business, if you want to engage as a freelancer, if you want to take part in the gig economy, you are empowered to do so, you know your rights, you know how to generate value and how to uh, create employment uh, for yourself. Um, but I want to come back to Haja on that point. Then to get your thoughts around women and, and enterprise, because there seems to be a, a, a bit of a, a dilemma here. So is enterprise, and notably female-headed business, is that the solution to empowering women? Or is it overly ambitious, and we need to just simply be looking at ensuring that uh, women and youth have basic uh, business skills? Actually, if, if you may allow me to go back to the um, other question sure. of what what OECD but also other stakeholders can can do to ensure youth participation but also let me draw to women's participation. I think what often happens is that whenever there is a new agenda or a new interest, for example now we're seeing a lot of focus on youth and then the question is how to include youth. And let's say there is a um, global forum on addressing budgeting, for instance, or a global forum on uh, countering terrorism, etc. Um, and then among that theme or debate, there will be the discussion on how to include youth. And then the simple solution will be that, okay, let's bring a young youth ambassador or representative to, uh, to just sit on a panel and, and speak and share their perspective. What often happens is that this young person is not listened to. So what happens is that we have the official openings from the policy makers, the decision makers. Um, they come to the event, they speak for five minutes, it's scripted speech, and then they leave. And then it's only youth who agree to each other, who agree on their agenda, who knows their priorities, who basically are not having any problems among each other, sitting on the table or in one room discussing with each other. And that is one of the problems. So the answer to that, it's not only one thing. It's not let's bring this young person to speak or let's invite this young person to perhaps just join this meeting. What we want as young people to be included is, and what you mentioned, the closed uh, doors meetings, behind the doors meeting. We want to be included in all levels. So whether it is the policy debate, whether it is the closed door meetings, whether it is the open doors meetings, whether it is the press conference. So when we talk about the inclusion of youth, but also women, we're basically talking about including us in every single process at every single level, which is obviously until this moment is not happening. So the youth agenda or the youth debate is relatively new. But then when it comes to women's rights and empowering women, we have been talking about this for so long. And I mean, I'm saying we have been talking about this. I'm only 24, uh, 25 years old, but other women before me have been talking about this for so long and we're still talking about it. 
So again, we want to be truly included. We want to be formally, non-formally, in every single level included. So you remind me of the, the kind of the broader diversity discussion that you need to have everybody on the committee or around the table that reflects gender, ethnicity, race, uh, age, uh, and perhaps that's some advice back to the OECD that when you are having developmental discussions or um, committees or constructs that you make sure that there are not only very senior people on the committee but that you might invite more junior employees to be there to be part of the conversation and then uh, apply that to uh, external audiences as well. Uh, I just want to remind the audience that you can send questions uh, via Twitter uh, and via Slido, which I believe will appear on the screen in front of me, hopefully, if our OECD comms people yes, can, can do that. Uh, I'm getting some uh, comments and questions, a comment around, should we just create a World Bank for women? Uh, don't know what you think about that one, uh, Haja, or gentlemen. An idea that we might aggregate capital specifically for um, female initiatives or I for initiatives promoting a uh, gender lens. Is that something you think would help? Is it about redistribution of capital? I guess it goes back to the question of if only 30% of Danish aid is going to women and youth, then uh, how can we expect outcomes that reflect what we aspire to? Um, I think it's... Uh it's already happening. There are, there are very, very large organizations or very, very large funds that have been established in the last mm -hmm. few years specifically to tackle women's issues. Um, one that comes to mind right now is a Time's Up um, who has a team of lawyers and has, uh, uh, I think, something like a $15 million fund for um, legal legal um, expenses and other, other related ones. So... You know, I, I think uh, a World Bank for Women um, already exists. Maybe it's not as centralized as it needs to be to help the most amount of people that uh, need to be helped. Um, but, you know, I, I don't think it's a bad idea. Masam? Um, well, I think um, we need more resources uh, for this cause, but I'm a bit concerned that um, once you create a new institution, I mean, it becomes a, uh, it can become a silo. It can become something that uh, will build uh, new walls instead of uh, bringing them down. And um, uh, even within the existing uh, framework, uh, you can actually um, put more emphasis on uh, those projects that really require uh, additional resources. Uh, moreover, I think we are discussing a mainstreaming of uh, gender issues or uh, youth issues. Um, this is uh, more uh, like a whole of government approach rather than a uh, single ministry or single institution dealing with it. So um, let's say more money, fine, but um, a new institution, um, a question mark. <laughs> Perhaps we have already too many institutions. So we are getting some questions from the floor. Let's take uh, the first one here. Uh, what can individual young privileged girls do in their everyday lives to improve the positions of those less fortunate? Over to you, panelists. Who'd like to take that one? Aja? Is that the first one? Sorry, the light is so strong. I can't yes, so asking basically that those young women who, who are privileged, what can they do to support their less fortunate sisters? Are there specific things that women can be doing, do you think, in the policy space, other than what we've already touched on? Yes, of course. And, and this is something that has been mentioned earlier as well, um, that when, when it comes to women empowerment um, and women's inclusion, other women should do more to other women. Um, what often happens, or sometimes, I can't say often, unfortunately, um, but usually, for instance, if we look at, at the case in Libya, um, we had a war that happened and then we had a transition period where there was an establishment of a new political process. And then we had the parliament. So as women's rights organizations, we invested so much time and effort to basically advocate to have a quota so women can be involved in the parliament and basically be members of this parliament. What happened afterwards is that the majority or many of the women who were elected within this quota, when we went to them and we were saying, okay, so as women, perhaps you should take the women's issues as a special cause for you. They were saying, no, 
um, we are not, we should not be forced to work to empower other women because we also want to do other stuff, which is completely understandable. I mean, they also want to contribute to the economic committee, the defense committee, etc. But then in the same time, um, I think women who reach these senior positions need to also be aware of how they got there. Because if a woman got there through a quota, that other women has pushed for it, then there should be a consent or um, let's say a norm um, where these women should actually do more towards that. Um, so indeed, and I mean, this is just one example when it comes to political participation. This can also be included in economic empowerment and, and sports, for instance, and any other things. Yeah. But it does seem that the value proposition of diversity is, is getting through, uh, according to a tweet uh, someone who sent us the um, Gallup poll of 2017 found that when it comes to bosses, Americans no longer prefer a man over a woman. Uh, and certainly we're seeing that even in parts of the Arab world where um, women are striving more in the education sector and in employment and delivering better outcomes because they are, have more motivation and, and uh, more drive. Uh, we're going to take a few more questions from the floor. I see some people deviating from the digital model, putting their hands up. Uh, if we have a mic available, I'm happy to, uh, to engage with you, but I'm not sure we have one on the floor. Do we have one? We do. Okay. Yes, so please, if you can just uh, tell us who you are and ask your question. Thank you so much. My name is Ian Hopwood. I'm based in Dakar, Senegal, so this is the voice from West Africa. Uh, I'd like to just raise two very quick questions that haven't really come out throughout the day. We talked about, frankly, scalability, documenting good practice, uh, things that work, evidence, and so on. We haven't really mentioned evaluation, and I think evaluation of the existing programs, policy, initiatives do give us. Evalnet's doing a great job here at OECD DAC, and there are techniques and methods now which we're promoting to actually engage adolescents and young people themselves as evaluators, as actors in the evaluation process. The other thing I'd say coming from West Africa is the issue of the, the OECD reports are wonderful and they're great, but they're one-off reports. We need to support ongoing multi-year programs of applied research, interdisciplinary, engaging decision makers, practitioners, and the young people and children themselves in the issues we're talking about. Because they're complex, they're mm -hmm. multi-causal, multi-level, they often be solved overnight. So I think those are two very important messages to bring from West Africa. And uh, you should also join the African Evaluation Association. We have a journal, and please publish your You're doing an ad now. That, yes, <laughs> I, I have a copy if anyone's interested. That's Thank okay. you so much indeed. No, no, a very relevant point, and I'll ask the panelists to comment on it. But I think it's this kind of basic idea is that not treating women or youth as passive beneficiaries. Let's get them on boards. Let's get them on, God forbid, committees. Uh, let's get them into policy dialogue. Uh, I know that in the organizations that I've run in the past, uh, my most effective management technique was to throw young people in at the deep end. Uh, when I found smart young people, male or female, was to allow them to thrive, give them responsibility. And I think we still have this idea that, that unless you're kind of um, old and grown up, you, you don't have uh, valuable ideas to bring to the table. And I think we need to turn that on its head. Uh, in the UAE, where I was working most recently, they appointed a youth minister who's 21, which freaked everybody out in the beginning because everybody said, well, she's only 21. How could she possibly uh, have enough experience to be able to manage or guide? Um, and I actually worked with her directly. She was one of my board members. And um, it, it never, her lack of experience never came across. She was smart and capable and had great ideas. And I think we need to kind of get over ourselves a little bit and just uh, really start engaging young people in strategic decisions. We know that young people from Zuckerberg to, to uh, even Ahmed here can, can create and run very successful organizations at a very early age. And yet still we seem to think that unless you're 50 plus, you don't have the expertise to advise on policy. But uh, comments from my panelists on that. And if not, I'm going to come to the next question, which we've got from, uh, from Slido, uh, which again, so can we get, uh, this is probably coming from the OECD for the next report, but uh, can you name three specific public policies to advance in, in gen gender equality? And that's an interesting point that was raised earlier, that are we looking at how policies more broadly impact youth and women? So tax policy, infrastructure policy, education policy. It's not just about having a gender policy. Hajar, if there was one thing you could have included in economic policy uh, in, in Libya, for example, what would be the first thing that comes to mind? 
same question to you shortly, Ahmed, and you, Masan. I mean, honestly speaking, I, 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 can't, I don't think I can articulate an answer for that because simply it's not a one answer because the whole problem or the issue is a cycle. So if you want to address something, you need to address the thing before, etc. So when it comes to economic empowerment of women, drawing back to the romanticization of women, um, I see that as an issue, for instance, because if we're going to talk about um, a certain sector that a country want to, to invest in, um, if that sector basically is looked at as a, a hard sector, for instance, then by default, women will not be included there. Um, let's talk about a country that wants to in invest in, um, in, let's say, the market industry, or even even when it comes to stocks. You know, um, it's often looked at that this is a very hard sector, more or less. It needs someone who can be there the whole time. It needs someone who's uh, also smart mathematically, and and all of these stereotypes as well. So in return, um, women will certainly not be included there. So for me, when it comes to finding solutions. Um, and again, I might be like literally drawing from my own context and what I see. I see that the problem of stereotypes and how women are looked at um, is the main problem because that affects every single aspect, whether it, it comes to the economic part, the defense part, but also the social part, for instance. But what would a policy solution be to that? I mean, we heard earlier some of the, the women on the panel before saying that the way you address that mindset is simply ensuring that young boys that are raised in a way where they are thinking progressively and they are thinking about equality. Is, is that a societal responsibility or is it a policy issue? I mean, then the question is that does society change happen through political change or political change happen through society change? And I don't think there is a one answer for that. Um, but policy certainly affects societies, um, whether when it comes through education, but also when it comes to laws. So for instance, in the labor law, there is a law that basically doesn't allow Libyan women to work in, in jobs that require night shifts. What is the reason for that? Again, it's because of, of these stereotypes of how women are looked at. Women should not spend the nights outside of the home. Um, whether it's because of more a conservative thought, but not only when it comes to that. Maybe because, you know, we don't want to put so much effort on the woman. So basically, she, a woman should not take night shifts, for instance. So again, it's not only about changing one certain policy, but it's about changing this mindset that women are not capable enough to provide 100% as a man will be able to do so. Yes, and it's interesting you mentioned that there's research that shows that Arab women entrepreneurs systematically uh, choose businesses that challenge social norms rather than just businesses that are commercially viable as their focus as entrepreneurs. Uh, Masam, do you want to comment on the last question? Well, um, of course, uh, if I put on my OECD uh, hat, <laughs> um, all of those policies are relevant, but, uh, and of course, I today, I, I, I mean, there were many things mentioned, but I, I would, of course, put education at the top only because um, basically uh, we are now working on the premise of universal education, and then we also have um, um, research results or survey results that um, um, show that uh, girls who are better than boys in uh, secondary and tertiary education. Um, and education is important, but if I may add one point that is not referred to too much, um, uh, and possibly not today, um, uh, I didn't attend all the sessions, but financial literacy, because um, um, in many countries, in many cases, um, women stay away from important decisions uh, because they are not either well informed of uh, financial matters or they're not controlling uh, the budget uh, of either the household or the firm or the, uh, the uh, or any other body. And financial literacy is uh, a core and um, this is not necessarily systematically uh, taught or um, made compulsory in, uh, in education. And I think this is a very important aspect. I'm glad you mentioned it, and it reiterates the point we made earlier around even if not every young person is going to be an entrepreneur, every young person needs some basic business acumen and the ability to manage their own 
uh, finance is absolutely critical to empowering them and to prosperity. Um, we are slowly but surely running out of time, so uh, I'm going to turn to Ahmed to give a final commentary on um, on how youth collaborate. We have talked about uh, co-management of policies, and we've talked about how you started the conversation by saying that you know if youth are not engaged in formal policy dialogue, they will they will create it themselves. But we've seen in the 21st century in the digital age that youth uh, collaborate quite effectively. We have this idea of collaborative consumption. And um, I was struck by the uh, topical subject, how the French railway strike uh, contributed to an increase in the use of blah, blah car. And some of the people I knew uh, in my immediate environment, when they heard there was a strike, all the young people said, yeah, I'll do the covoiturage, you know, car sharing, and all the old people panicked and said, goodness me, I can't get a train. Uh, and uh, that's the kind of disruptive thinking that I think we overlook in policy making decisions that, as you said, if, if you don't get the policy that you like, you can go ahead and create it simply because you have that access. As digital natives, you are able to, from a very early age, talk to millions of people. You are no longer just influenced by your uh, immediate neighbors. And we see that even in countries that may not have um, super high connectivity. Uh, you know, kids in low income communities in Africa have been proven to be equally adept with an iPad at the age of three uh, as any of those in, in uh, the Northern Hemisphere. So how, what do you think is going to be a key, uh, a key modus operandi for women or youth to really ensure that they own the agenda. We had conversations yesterday about who owns the youth agenda, and it went from Ministry of Youth to Ministry of Sport to Ministry of Economy to Ministry of Education. But what are the tools that you would call upon people to use so that you can own the agenda if the international community or traditional establishments are not listening to you enough? How can you take your message forward anyway? Uh, I think you hit on upon, uh, upon a lot there. I think one of the main things uh, two main things is agency and access. Um, and we all talked about this earlier. Uh, one thing I really do want to highlight that, Hadjar, uh, you mentioned is uh, this romanticization that can come about when we're talking about these issues, whether it's youth empowerment um, as a whole um, or uh, these certain qualities um, that people kind of automatically ascribe to women. Um, you know, with it being soft or whatever you mentioned earlier. Um, I think it's, it's so, so dangerous um, being in spaces, uh, sometimes being in spaces that um, are really progressive and, and that you're there with people that agree with you and you fall into this kind of pattern of romanticizing issues that really shouldn't be romanticized. Um, earlier, um, you mentioned, uh, again, that this, this incredible power to start an organization um, and, and kind of do whatever uh, it is you want to employ yourself, em employ people in your community. Um, but also, th again, I don't want to make it seem like it's something that's really easy, that is just a solution to everything that, is, that can just happen. Um, these issues are very, very complex, uh, as we learned throughout the past couple of days, um, and, and we need multiple, multiple actors, although um, anyone can start a business right now, a, a young person can go on and, and, and start anything. The, we need help um, from uh, big institutions. Um, you know, we would prefer to be partners. We don't want to do it ourselves. You know, um, if, we, if you know if we had to, that's a different conversation. But we would welcome this collaboration um, that's ongoing. Um, and, and earlier you talked about youth collaboration. What are some examples of that? Um, in my own experience, I've seen that come to life through art. Um, more recently, I partnered with a Syrian architect. Um, who remodels uh, the homes um, uh, in, in Syria and uh, remodels and creates miniature models of, of homes and places that he left as a kid. Um, we have a project called Unpacked Refugee, um, where I interviewed 10 refugee families who settled to the US, audio interviews, and he remodeled their homes inside of a series of suitcases. And this is a traveling exhibition. Um, it's going to be international very soon. Um, it's just unpackedrefugee.com. And um, during this, this project, we, ha we interviewed a woman um, from Afghanistan um, who, at the age of 22, uh, started an underground school in Iran for undocumented Afghan children who couldn't go to traditional Irani school uh, because of their uh, uh, citizenship status. And uh, she taught 300 students in a basement at the age of 22. And 
now is a professor at the University of New Haven in the US. And she came to the US about five, six years ago. So it's these types of stories that really just um, you know, give me hope of, of what is possible um, and, and, and of the resilience that exists within these communities, whether it be youth um, or whether it be women. Thank you, Ahmed. And thank you to all of you for doing a brilliant job of uh, broadly summarizing. We're going to leave it to the OECD to do the scientific summary of uh, the day's discussions. But just to touch on the points we've mentioned, so I think uh, you, you've clearly made the point uh, that policy is not uh, a construct that youth can't uh, influence. If you don't have direct access, you can create your own access using the platforms you have that if we invest in women, there is a tangible return, an economic return, a social return, even a, a financial return uh, that should be measurable and hopefully scalable. Um, and that leaving, uh, giving the, the overall agenda for this event, uh, leave no one behind, that policymakers need to ensure that they are engaging with both youth and women or potentially finding themselves being left behind. Uh, and the final conclusion that there needs to be resources put to all of this. So if we can see that number of 30%, uh, one third of uh, Danish aid being dedicated to youth and women transformed into who knows, maybe 100%, then hopefully we can see some uh, real progress on the ground. So uh, thank you so much to my panelists for a great discussion. Thank you to all of you. And um, I guess uh, we will see you all again soon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Claire. Uh, thank you to our panelists. Uh, thank you, uh, Mr. Kono, Deputy Secretary General. This was a, a fascinating discussion. Thank you, all of you, for being here uh, today, to our interpreters also for their uh, work and uh, patience and adaptability, uh, and uh, to uh, uh, all the organizers uh, of this 10th edition of the Global Forum on Development. The 10th edition. So we would just like to remind you that we would love for you to continue the conversation with us on Twitter. Please continue reacting. If you weren't able to pose a, ca a question, please engage with us. We will come forward with a summary in order to really get out some of the wonderful things that were said about the work on youth, the ways that we can empower women and youth more effectively going forward. And we would like to invite you to... The 2019 Global Forum on Development. And to all of you who are new to the Global Forum, lots of those who raised their hands when the under 30s were called on uh, from, from the stage. Stay tuned, uh, also share uh, the news that uh, this is a platform where everybody's welcome to share their ideas. We need to be influenced uh, as OECD by uh, different visions uh, and we count on you to continue on social media and in person next year here for the Global Forum. Thank you once again. Thank you.